Hey, what is going on, guys? Hope you're having a great <laughs> Sunday. Welcome to the AV Experience. My voice is a little hoarse, but we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We've got Stop the FOMO in the house. FOMO has been a while. Good to see you, brother. I I'm having fun already, man. <laughs> He's already ranting backstage, man. I'm ranting and you haven't even clicked play yet. <laughs> oh, for sure, man. Jonathan, good to see you. Ryan, what's happening, fellas? I'm glad to be home from, where were we? Utah. Utah, man. Yeah. That was a lot of fun, but I got home and I was like, man, I feel pretty good. And then the next day I'm like, I hurt. I hurt. But it was it was a lot of fun. I you really got snowboard or ski? I ski. Michael, yeah. the real guy snowboard. Oh, whatever. But in all fairness, I don't, I get tired quicker on the dang snowboard, man. Ryan's just <laughs> zooming and zooming and zooming. I'm like catching my breath going, dang, this is rough. To your defense, you were sick. I was, yeah. Still I'm sick, but I'm here. <clears throat> but yeah, man, we had a blast over there. Claude is actually in the chat. Good to see you, Claude. Claude, hey, Claude it's been a while. What's yep. Claude's name? Bethea. Oh, okay. I haven't Claude seen him Bethea. yet. Yep. So he's over in the chat. So good to see you, buddy. Um, but yeah, we're going to have a great time tonight. We're talking TVs. We're talking calibrated TVs. Oh, yeah. Maybe and uncalibrated calibrate. TVs. And un well, maybe we should talk uncalibrated TVs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uncalibrated TVs. There's some, some drama there, but we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about maybe in your home, but mm -hmm. also um, at M Wave. We've made some decisions and we're going to share that with you. We'll give you some updates on Ryan's home theater. And uh, if you got a question, we'll leave it in the chat. Of course, super chats get first priority, but definitely not necessary. So drop those in the chat whenever you're ready. So I'm going to let you guys do a lot of the talking tonight because as you can tell my voice is, it just kind of comes and goes. It sounds like I'm going through puberty again, man. I hate that. <laughs> yeah, don't get me started. Otherwise, I won't stop talking. That's all good, man. But we're so going to have the some fun. The initial question was, I think, uh, should we do calibrated or uncalibrated TVs? We announced that we were going to do uncalibrated, and then some people got a little... A little heated. A little, <laughs> a little upset. Heated. A little disappointed. Yeah. So we decided, hey, we're going to bring on FOMO, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we want to make sure that you don't have any fear of missing out if they're uncalibrated. Or they're or, or rather, you have, you have someone to throw under the bus, because it was my decision to go uncalibrated. <laughs> just, just so everyone knows, right? Uh, Ryan would like... He's like, you know what? Shouldn't we do calibrated? I'm like, you know what? I don't think we should. And he goes, okay, let's, let's not do calibrated this year. And unlike last year, so just to compare, last year's M-Wave, Jason Dustel calibrated all the TVs, right? And so what you saw last year were all the TVs calibrated. And then this year I said, you know, the intent originally was to do it uncalibrated. So it was quite surprising to me when Brian and I walked in, wait, they're all calibrated. Jason, what are you doing here? Hey guys, I'm here to calibrate. <laughs> it's like, oh, right. And then this year I said, okay, let's do it the way I envisioned it, which is out of the box uncalibrated however ryan brought up a good point which is let's have at least a reference monitor of some sort right just yes. so they can see what they're missing i go that fair enough i think that that actually works very well because last year we didn't have access to reference anyway and if this year we didn't we would have calibrated one tv that calibrates well and then you know have that one calibrated and but there is definitely a purpose to not calibrating the tvs and this is not clickbait because the title is very clear Calibrated TV reviews, reviews, is it useful or misleading? And the assumption, so we'll get rolling here. Normally, I like to warm up, but I think this is important to understand. What is the objective you're trying to get out of the TV review? So whether it's M-Wave, whether it's uh, the shootout, right? Each has an objective. And the M-Wave objective, the Midwest AV experience, if you're not familiar with it, is it's not a shootout, right? It is not intended to demonstrate this TV is clearly better than that TV. My goal is at M-Wave to show you, okay, these TVs out of the box. We'll play with the settings, we'll show you what they do, and we'll compare them against each other out of the box, which is exactly how consumers look at the TVs. And this is why calibrated TV reviews can be misleading. If you look at ratings or any of our reviews, once it's calibrated, right, you'll notice, wow, these TVs calibrate to like 97% accuracy, 98%, like Delta less than 1%, Delta 0.5%, all of them, right? 
all of these TVs over $1,000, right? Good TVs calibrate really well. That doesn't tell you anything because here is the part that's misleading. If you get, let's say, an El Cheapo TV, a $700 TV, and then you, cal and you do a review and it's calibrated and it looks amazing, that $700 TV is never going to get calibrated. And so the misleading part is the consumer who reads that review and sees how amazing it is, short of spending another $400 to calibrate it, it is mm. not going to look anything like that out of the box because it, the difference between a $700 TV that's uncalibrated and one that's calibrated is quite stark. Now, as you go up the pricing range, eight, nine, 2000 3000 they actually come out of the box a little bit more accurate not fully accurate but you know, again i'm going to use ratings artings.com before calibration the two thousand dollar tvs are consistently above 80 percent accuracy and then after calibration they're like 94 percent, all of them mm -hmm. right but before calibration they're all in the 80s if you go below 700 dollars, they're all in the 70s possibly worse and at the end of the day you could calibrate any TV, it's going to look accurate, but the goal isn't for you guys, you know, as a reviewer, I have two objectives. One is TV recommendations, which is separate and apart from which is the technically superior TV. And when you want to go with technical superiority, you have to calibrate to a standard. And then once it's calibrated, you pick content that separates the best TV, content you would never watch, Spears and Munsell, right? No one watches Spears and Munsell or mm -hmm. literally five second scenes from movies that we all know and love, 1917, Pan, Mad Max. I mean, there's so many of these movies, but they're literally just five second snippets from the entire movie that's very difficult to resolve, whether it's dynamic range on the upper end or on the lower end. And again, this is why it's misleading. Until you calibrate it, put it in those conditions in a completely dark room, then you separate the TVs and then suddenly one TV is better. The misleading part is that TV might be better in that condition, but the TVs that didn't come close in those conditions in a bright room watching what you're watching, indistinguishable, especially if they're uncalibrated as well. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I want M-Wave to be different from these shootouts because the perfect example is the last shootout, right? The Sony A95L, it won, it's the king of TVs, but lots of issues. One, Dolby Vision is inaccurate. It's lifted, it's, it's, it needs a firmware update. You cannot calibrate that out. And, but that was never mentioned in, very few reviewers mention that because they think, oh, you know, Dolby Vision, that's what it looks like. Wait, what do I know? Mm -hmm. And the, the issue is, if you have to calibrate a TV to make it look good, I think that misleads the consumer who doesn't plan to calibrate his TV. Now, if you are a consumer who plans to calibrate your TVs, then you need to watch a review that compares all TVs calibrated. Now, on my reviews, all of my TVs are calibrated, but I also try to show the TV before they're calibrated to compare it to my calibrated TVs just to see if there's a big difference, right? And some TVs don't calibrate well at all. TCL is one of them. That it's all over the place, right? It's panel lottery. Sometimes out of the box, you calibrate it, doesn't matter. It still looks terrible. The colors are off for whatever reason. And sometimes it calibrates really well, whereas other TVs consistently, they will calibrate well. Sony, LG to name a few. And now Samsung out of the box is pretty accurate. I mean, you know, calibration helps a little bit. But at M-Wave, what our hope is, look, you have a reference monitor here. So you know what a good calibrated TV looks like and you have all these TVs in filmmaker mode, out of filmmaker mode. This is what you can expect out of the box. If you don't like that, it will easily calibrate to look just like that reference monitor, right? And if you like what you see, you don't have to calibrate it. But if I have all the TVs calibrated, I cannot give you that option because now you're gonna to say to me, do I have to calibrate it to make it look like this? And I have to say yes, because I don't know what it looks like uncalibrated. And a lot of people say, well, why don't you have two settings, you know, calibrated, uncalibrated? Unfortunately, not all TVs make that easy to do. It's just easier to say, look, here's your reference monitor. And all these TVs have been chosen because first of all, they're not cheap. Even at M-Wave, they're like at least $1,000 and above. They'll right. all calibrate well. I fully believe that today, if you buy a TV that's $1,000 and up, it's going to calibrate fine. Hopefully TCL addresses uh, their issue this year. But our goal is to let you see three things, right? Size. Don't you want to see what a 98-inch TV looks like? Forget the calibration part. 
this is 98 inches. Is it bright enough for you? How's the reflection handling? And your streaming content. So we're going to put out streaming content. You know, this is what you're going to look at. And if you want to calibrate it, go ahead. But the reason you buy this TV, because it's large, right? And then you compare it to a slightly smaller OLED, 83 inch maybe. How does that look? You know, look at the infinite contrast and compare the two. And if you put the 98 inch in filmmaker mode, the 83 inch OLED in filmmaker mode, they'll be close enough and you'll see slight differences. You'll, you know what? I like how the Sony comes out of the box. Mm -hmm. There you go. They answer your question. Get the Sony out of the box that looks like that. This 98 inch TCL Hisense Samsung out of the box will look like that more often than not. I know it's panel lottery, but still. So M-Wave is for the consumer buyer. It's not meant to be a critical comparison, but we want to treat every review like a critical com critical comparison i mean comparison. would you say that it's not a critical comparison but tvs now are close enough that it's almost you're having to nitpick at that mm -hmm. point especially when they're all calibrated i mean you're you're really trying to having to really dig deep to find faults yes absolutely and well just dig deep to find faults that's why i have to use spears and munsell Without the Spears and Munsell disc, it's very hard to find fault with the TV. Now, some TVs it's easy because you know exactly what the weaknesses are. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to use TCL again because their motion settings are very raw. They don't have Sony's, LG's, or even Samsung's motion settings to play with. It's either this, this, or this. It's one of those three. You either like it or you don't. You either like soap opera or you're okay with stutter. It's very hard to get something in between, but at least you know what you're getting. And mm -hmm. it's not hard to put out content that will show that motion issues on a TCL. But skin tones, right? Skin tones out of the box, it is what it is. If you calibrate it, it should get better and it, but in filmmaker mode most tvs are doing a pretty good job with skin tones i have to say most okay. you know there are exceptions but i've seen the samsung last year's s90c s95c and the g3 and the sony a95l and a95k calibrated after calibration side by side you'll see a difference but if i was just to walk in and watch the same scene without it side by side, I'd be like, wow, this actually looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so that to your point, it's close enough that they're within 5% of each other. A lot of people won't complain short of, I know there are calibrators out there. I, I see you all. You guys are so used to seeing skin tones in a certain way with your favorite material. You'll see the difference, but most consumers, if it looks natural, that's good enough for mm -hmm. them. Like how mm -hmm. many people do we know that look at a calibrated TV? Wait, this D65 looks way too warm. I thought white looks a certain way. And I know many calibrators tell me, yeah, every time a customer tells me, I want another setting where the white looks a little bit more white, like more blue, right? And so they have that setting that looks like white to them. They don't like D65. And subjective it, white. It's very subjective white. And so, you know, they, they have to give them the, the few, like on a Sony, you have the few modes that you could play with that they can choose from. And ultimately they end up just with, bright room mode because they're in a bright mm -hmm. room and that's another thing if you calibrate a tv to a dark room so all of my reviews calibrated tvs in a dark room but th that in your room will be too dark so suddenly you're going to use isf bright dolby vision bright or on an lg it's cinema home right that throws calibration out the window <laughs> and if you're mm -hmm. doing that a little oversaturate a little brighter than normal right and, and the blacks are slightly lifted so you can see your shadow detail because you're in a bright room then it goes to the second point which is what's the point of calibrating if i know you're going to watch tv in a bright room where everything's a little off and so at the end of the day i think it ends up being a wash where your calibration dollar doesn't really get you what you think you're getting but critical viewers like you guys, you have a dedicated home theater. It's a man cave. Sure, absolutely. Why not? But and this so this is why in M Wave, we won't calibrate the TVs, but we'll have a reference monitor so you guys can see how off it is. Is it important to you get it calibrated? And if you want to calibrate it, it'll get there. And and the it's that point one percent of the audience that says. Well, how close can it get? I want the TV that gets the closest. Well, that's not sure. M-Wave. That's a real shootout. Yeah. So something that I want people to think about that are in chat is a lot of people, when they calibrate a TV and they move from like before the calibration to after the calibration, you really don't have a good way to compare post-result back to how mm -hmm. the TV was. 
Right. And so I challenge a lot of you that say, hey, there was a huge difference to remember. And maybe there was, depending on the mode that you were looking at, that a lot of that is subjective, right? So yes, there can be. Like you may notice that things are not as green or blue or yellow or whatever the TV was skewing. But then you have to ask yourself, did I really care that few percentage points difference before until I saw the difference? So you've got to decide, and I'm not saying calibration is bad, but you got to decide, like I always say, how far do you want to chase the rabbit, mm -hmm. right? How far are you willing to go and spend in order to get those few extra percentage points? And if you don't ever do the direct AB comparison with calibrated versus uncalibrated, that is what we're doing at M-Wave versus the mastering monitor with the uncalibrated TVs. Does it really matter? If the picture looks great for you, doesn't matter. How close is good enough? And one thing, your, that, no, ahead, saying, one thing that I've seen a lot is usually we're using what we call torture tests. You know, these are just really extreme cases, like you said, from Spears and Munsell. And we're showing those tests. And, and a lot of times that is pretty obvious when you're comparing one TV to another or one projector to another. Um, but the reality is most of us aren't watching torture tests. We're watching Mad Max. We're watching Lucy. We're watching, you know, The Greatest Showman, uh, real world content where that's changing constantly throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. And probably most of us, in something like that, we're not going to notice as big of a difference. And the other thing is a lot of times you can't, you don't know what you have until you put it like literally side by side to something else and how it really compares. And um, so yeah. there is that most people don't have that option. We provide that option at M wave because we want you to see side by side comparisons. Some people are going to come into yours and Brian's room and we're going to look at that and, and go, man, out of the box, that TV looks better than this one. And they're going to mm -hmm. make a buying decision based off of just that, what they see in real world content. Um, so we're just trying to trying to think outside the box this year. Is it is it more beneficial to have calibrated TVs or is it better to have uncalibrated TVs and have a reference monitor of what that calibration should look like? And then you can visually see how much deviation is there in these colors or uh, in the contrast and so forth. Yeah. And well, to that point, and so this comment is also similar to what we're talking about. When they say, explain how far they deviate from reference, right? Hey, thanks, high def, def news. So it's one thing when you have it side by side, right? You have a reference and mm -hmm. out of the box, and you could see the difference. But if I said to you, it's 5%, 3%, 1%, 0.3%, the percentages make no sense to you. Yeah, what does that have, mean? Right. And so even if, so I, I'm going to use ratings, and I love ratings.com. It's nothing against them, but they're very clear, right? They say, okay, three less than 3%, not noticeable, over 3%. I get all of that, but then there's no side-by-side. -side. Like, is well, it skin tones? I'm and less than 3% or over, less noticeable to who? I, I mean, exactly. it's all subjective. Mm -hmm. So whether it's one way or the other, I mean, saying things like that, with how the human eye works and how we perceive things and all this in our experiences, there's so many variables to say that, oh, you're not going to notice it if it's under 3%. Well, some people might, and some people might not go. notice over 3%. So it just, there's a lot mm -hmm. of subjectivity that comes into this. And I'm going back again. What is good enough? And there was a comment in here about Best Buy that I put on the screen. Where did it go? Where did it go? Andrew, somewhere. Hey, Andrew. It was here somewhere. I there it is. That. So Andrew put it up. Years ago, they offered calibration, had calibrated versus uncalibrated side by side. Most normal people preferred out of the box. And that's a great point. There is a reason why <laughs> big box stores use torch mode, because that's what people like. A lot of people, they like blue. They like brightness. We're like moths to a flame. If it's bright and it's blue, we're going <laughs> to like it. So people have right or wrong, a subjective opinion of what they like and that's why you mentioned this earlier fomo that a lot of times when things are calibrated when calibrators are doing something to somebody that doesn't know a lot about video almost mm -hmm. always they're having to put in a mode that gets them back closer to what torch mode gives them because they'll look at something that is calibrated and be like 
well, that's too warm. It's too brown. It's too yellow. Not realizing that that's closer to what the calibrated specs should be. Now, I personally like doing a calibration and then deviating away from that calibration to my subjective taste, but my subjective taste isn't calibrated either. So food for thought. Yep. And at, now a last food for thought. So that brings up another point. The Sony TVs from last year that had XR clear, mm -hmm. even if you calibrated, you could not disable XR clear. And, and during the shootout, we noticed that mm -hmm. the XR clear on the Sony A95L consistently raised the brightness of specular highlights above reference. So the G3 measured perfectly. The Sony did not. And the S95C measured perfectly. They both look identical to the reference monitor in terms of the specular highlights. The Sony, always a touch brighter. All, only in those specular highlights. You know, it wasn't raised in the other areas of the scene. So you see the XR Clear specifically appealing to the consumer. They're like, mm -hmm. you know what? You guys want HDR? Mm -hmm. We'll give it to you. But you could disable it. And guess what? They won the king of TVs. Yep. <laughs> so what is that? To and, Shocker. And I, spoke, I spoke to a lot of judges, and a few of them were like, I noticed it. I don't care. And a few of them knocked them down for it. So that's why the Sony didn't get perfect scores, because I spoke to them. And they're like, oh, no, we noticed it. And I wasn't happy with it. But some guys are like, you know what? I kind of like it, right? Because it's subjective at the end of the day. Now, if you compare it directly to the reference monitor, you will see the difference. There's no doubt about it. But it's not. But are you talking like 3% again? I mean, are we talking something that some people are going to notice that some people aren't? So... And this is where everyone says, oh, the A95L has a three-dimensional pop. That's what Sony did. And so mm -hmm. how many consumers say to me, hey, which TV has a three-dimensional pop? I want that. And I read that to mean, which TV you cannot disable this extra <laughs> non-calibrated non mode where everything looks a little bit brighter than it should be in the specular highlights, right? Oh, yeah, you want the Sony A95L or whatever with XR clear because Sony is very clear to me. This is what we're doing. We're making these images look more appealing to the human eye. We know we're, we're going to sharpen this and do that. And, and you can't disable it, though. That's the beautiful thing. Like, you know what? We're going to own it. We're going to win. <laughs> We're going to call it a day and they did and you know it, it was well worth it because xr clear was highly praised for that effect and guess what lg is doing the same thing this year with their ai director mode right except you could disable it but it's essentially mm -hmm. doing the same thing if you read the description it's going to take organic scenes and make it more appealing right skin tones will be richer when you read it like oh you guys lost last year because you didn't have xr clear now you have something similar and we'll see enabled how well it does but the, the brands see what consumers like they're just adjusting to the consumer mm -hmm. so i see a bunch of people saying and commenting about why calibration is important we're not dismissing that calibration yeah. is important what we're <clears throat> discussing is should you oh, hi, Sloan. <laughs> oh yeah you got your croc no this oh you fell love you uh oh sorry so what we're discussing is, does it make sense for the average consumer to judge purchasing a TV based on the calibrated mode, right? Mm -hmm. Because most people aren't going to calibrate, plain and simple. Most people right. are not going to calibrate a TV. We so even asked our audience like on the last, the last podcast, maybe two podcasts ago, I said, hey, let me know. We're, this is something we're thinking about. Let me know in the chat if you've calibrated your TV. And I think we had two. Yeah. I said, yeah, I've calibrated my TV. Yeah. Everybody else was out of pocket. I haven't calibrated yeah. mine. Mine's I mean, just... I work in the industry and none of my <laughs> TVs are calibrated. No. Mm -hmm. But they're, and, I think they're yeah. close enough. They're good enough. Yeah. I mean, and maybe if I put them next to a reference monitor, I'd be like, oh, but until I do that. So, so you know, me. so this brings up such another good point. The way the pro calibration people and the anti, and I don't want to say anti, like, ah, calibration, mm -hmm. whatever, right? So, so the loosely, you're ambivalent by calibration. We're not that far apart because we're, it's not like if it's uncalibrated, it looks like crap. So you got to, you know, it is so close that if you calibrate it, it looks slightly more accurate. I'm not saying that if you don't calibrate, it looks way over in left field and then calibrating gets you creator's intent. I mean, you already have maybe. close. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you're under $700, that's why I use a $700 example. If you're buying a thousand dollar TV or more, it has filmmaker mode. It has its accurate mode. 
in that mode, you are so close to calibration that once you calibrate, you'll be like, okay, I see a slight difference, but that creator's intent was not lost before the calibration, in my opinion. <laughs> it was so close already. You're, it's, it's, it's like that when you're running a race, you could set a world's record or you could set an NCAA record. The NCAA mm -hmm. record is good enough for most people. You don't need to it's like, like the best of the best because it's so close. And, I'm, and that's where we are today. Maybe during the CRT era, I'd have a different opinion because you were totally off, right? But modern premium TVs, and so again, $1,000 TVs, we're not talking insignias and fire TVs of the world. And even they're not bad, by the way, but their accurate mode is so close that Calibration gets you closer to the creator's intent for the super anal retentive among us who would have either learned to calibrate yourself or pay for a calibrator. But you guys have said maybe that's 0.1% of the population. And it does a disservice to the other 99% for me to focus on the calibration when the reality is, well, I'm not going to calibrate. Does this apply to me? And I don't want to have that question hanging over their heads. So what I want to ask, Nice, what do you mean by this? Yeah, I was just looking at that one. So Nice says, this conversation would be nice to have with calibrators, lots of misunderstanding concepts and options floating around. Is there something that we said, or is that just stuff that's being said in chat? I'm right. not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to get clarification to make sure that everybody's yeah. on the same page. And, and to be fair, all of my TVs that I review get calibrated, right? I have Sammy Prescott calibrate all my TVs. And I tell people, hey, this is uncalibrated. This is what it looks like. And then we calibrate it. And that's when I do my side by side on the same standard in the same scene. But then when doing something like M Wave, I sense it's a different experience because I don't want everything to be a shootout. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a place for a shootout, sure. there's a place for it because Best Buy and Costco, everything is in torch mode, retail mode. That's also inappropriate. Can we have some middle ground where people can <laughs> enjoy what they're seeing out of the box and the way they'll see it at home and then have a reference monitor? That is fully calibrated, right? Ryan, what kind of reference monitor do you think we'll be able to get for the mm, for M-Wave? I don't know. If, I'm trying to get Sony's reference. The new one mm -hmm. or any? Well, any. Any. Oh, any. Okay. any. And I'm going to go back to Nice, and he says, you and FOMO. Can you elaborate on that? What were... I don't know that we're, we haven't even <laughs> talked about calibration concepts or anything like that. So do you mind elaborating? And anyway. if, if, you, if you just joined, we're just saying that for M-Wave, the purpose is for consumers who don't plan to calibrate. They, what do they expect from a TV when they bring it home? Here's a calibrated TV or here's a calibrated reference monitor, either one. This is, these TVs are not calibrated. This is out of the box. So play with the settings because... More than half the time at last year's M Wave, they wanted to see it in standard mode. So even if I had to calibrate it in filmmaker mode, they're like, can we have it in standard mode? And so we ended up in standard mode more often than not. Now we do move back you know, for other people, right? But a lot of people are like, yeah, but at home, so we have to turn on the lights and then I turn on the lights and what happened, there was glare on half the TVs. And so I had to put it on standard mode to kind of overcome the glare. And so ultimately when you go through that process, the, the calibration is completely lost because this is not critical viewing. There is no judging, there is no winner, but rather these are the TVs, these are the settings. Which settings do you like? And half the time, you know, let's see in standard mode. I always watch sports in dynamic mode. What does that look like? Oh, the discussion had nothing to do with accuracy. Nothing at all. No. Mm. And I want to clarify for people that are, and maybe this is directed at nice. This is not us saying that you shouldn't get things calibrated. Like calibration provides a level of confidence that what you are seeing is how it should be in, it was intended, right? This isn't us saying, don't get your display calibrated. This is us saying that the majority of consumers aren't going to care about calibration, right? That's what this is about. So if we're showing things at M-Wave, our assumption or our thoughts are that we should show them in the sense that most people want to see them and are going to use them because most people, when they get them home, are not going to calibrate them, right? I could, like, I've got my jetty. I've got my calibration gear here. I just... It's one of those things like when you're a painter, you're probably not painting your own house, right? So I just haven't done that here. I calibrated my projector and I will calibrate the other projectors, but the TVs, you know, I'm not doing critical viewing on those. Typically I'm doing that in the theater and I just haven't done that. So this again, that most people are not going to calibrate the display. 
They're just not. I mean, I would bet under 1% of people calibrate their TV. So why should they base a buying decision on a calibrated display? If they're not going to, you should get what makes the most sense for you out of the box. Because if it looks like crap before you calibrate it and you have to calibrate it to get the best, not that it looks like crap. I'm taking this to extreme. Why are you going to buy that? You're going to buy what's best for you out of the box. Most people do. Yeah. yeah. And and for those who want to calibrate, uh, Sammy, you're asking, depending where you are, but on average, anywhere from $400 to $700, depending on your location. Do you have to fly them in? If you have a lot of calibrators in the area, probably $450, let's say in a metro area, California, Southern California, $450, $550, $600. And if you have to have to fly them in, and I'm sure Dwayne could help you quote that or Classy. Classy flies all over the country calibrating, but it's definitely on average about 500 or more, depending on how many people they're calibrating in your area, then you can get kind of like a volume deal. Mm -hmm. Like when I have a calibration done, Sammy comes here and literally is here from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. calibrating six TVs. So hey, I guys, get a volume discount. I think you're you're continuing to misunderstand the conversation. And I think it's mainly the calibrators that are misunderstanding this. And I feel like you think that we're attacking you. And we're not. The calibration monitor, as far as I know, Jason Dustel's coming. He's going to professionally yes. calibrate these the calibration monitor. We're not just going to get a calibration monitor and be like, hey, <laughs> compare Let's here. Go. That's not what's going to happen. <laughs> so this is, we're going to <laughs> calibrate. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should have said that first. Uh, the reference monitor will be calibrated by yes. Jason Dustel, right? Yeah, it will be calibrated. That's a good point. <laughs> so another reason, this brings up another good point, that the reason we're not doing this is because our time is not infinite, right? When we did the calibrations last year, it takes a lot of time for all of these TVs and then you have, if you have multiple calibrators, like how do you calibrate them all the same way? Because everybody has their own opinions. Then if something goes wrong in the calibration, then you got to do it again. And it's just that we want to make sure that everybody's time is used adequately. And we want to make sure that things are on as level playing field as we can. I mean, Sony did this at the CD demonstrations. They've done it at other demonstrations. They found that what they seem to think is most accurate. And LG actually said this too, that, uh, they just want things to be out of the box. And that's directly from the manufacturers. Samsung said the same thing to me as well. Yeah, I mean, they, they just want to sell TVs to what people want. If mm. people want, I mean, and to an example, Samsung has improved the filmmaker mode. It's more accurate today than it was when it first started. And they actually improved accuracy on the S95B QD OLED midway through firmware updates because they're, oh, you know what? Yeah, it could be more accurate. If people are demanding accuracy, they will get that better on the filmmaker mode, but it won't be fully calibrated. So, but, oh, let me adjust this real quick. No, the TVs at Best Buy are definitely not calibrated. <laughs> <laughs> they pull them out of the box and hook them up. A in torch mode, which and makes it, it worse. Torch so, mode, right. Yeah. yeah, so even if it was calibrated, it's in torch mode. So what's the yeah. point? Jonathan, you've been super quiet, man. I want to... I want to hear your perspective on yeah i mean i i don't disagree with what you guys are saying my own experience with calibration i had a calibrator come and do my projector this was with a epson 5040 and when it was done i couldn't hardly get it off that mode fast enough like it, it didn't appeal to me so i went back to my personal preference settings and i think at the end of the day i kind of come along where ryan had said we're you, it's probably a good idea to have it reference calibrated so you know where that is if you're really going to dive into this hobby. And then if you want to deviate off that, like I have what I call a half-C settings on my LS12000. There's a calibrated setting. And then I had my own subjective preference settings that I established before the calibration. And what I did is basically meet in the middle. So my everyday preference use settings is like kind of halfway between a, a richer, more saturated, more poppy, more dynamic, brighter image and the calibrated settings. And and, and that's a good place to land because it's maybe not as off-putting to somebody who really enjoys it at reference calibration that they're like, um, oh, you know, this is not right. But it still gives me a little bit more of a, a flavor to it, a little bit more video enjoyment uh, with a little extra saturation and so forth, color saturation and so forth. So I'm going back to chat because I'm going to, I keep seeing D-Nice and Classy Tech Calibrations disagreeing with us on certain things. If you guys have disagreements, you're not really elaborating on what you're disagreeing with. You're just kind of giving us general points like oh you're wrong but i'm not giving gonna give you the reasons that you're wrong 
So it's, it's too much to put in too chat. much to type or what? Like I'm perfectly fine being corrected. We stand here to make sure that we're conveying things correctly. I am not against changing. I am simply conveying what the general populace has said that they want. That's what this is about. So if you guys have constructive criticism, fire away. Yeah. Not against it, but just to have things of you're wrong, it doesn't help anybody, right? So if you've got guys have things to say, absolutely say them. Mm -hmm. But let's not do the just kind of generalizations and firing and just undershots. Not saying you are, but so I think you almost said as well that it's not you're not putting it in torch mode at M Wave. You're putting it kind of the more natural mode out of the box that the the TV companies would prefer that you use. So it's not like going. It's not the same as going to Best Buy. These TVs are going to be in kind of their best foot forward, their best presentation foot forward that you might get from like RTING's readings. You know, like like this is a good setting to use that kind of just general best practice type situation, right? So FOMO, can you elaborate on, you know, this is your, um, well, I guess you did it just last year. Yeah. This past so this year. is only the, what, the third year of M-Wave. It feels like we've been doing this for so long. <laughs> yeah. What, what is the lighting environment in your so, room? Okay, so let's we look, have right. complete control over Com that. We unlike do. We Cedia. Do. Cedia, you've got all the lights on. You can't turn the lights off at Cedia. Do you have the opportunity to do that at M-Wave? So at M Wave in our room, if we have the same room as we did last year, it's it's close to complete dark. I mean, you got all the exit signs, or whatever, but mm -hmm. there's no bright windows from the outside in, right? We can close the doors to a certain degree. You have little light leakages in the doors. So when I shoot the comparisons and, and live streaming, we'll have the lights off because the glare on the TV is more distracting. If I have the lights on, suddenly you're gonna literally see people sitting in the audience reflecting off the TVs. So I'm not turning it off for better color accuracy. It's just to see the TVs and, and we can talk about them because it's more distracting for the on the live stream to see four or five, six TVs side by side, but all you see are is a mirror off the TV. So mm -hmm. we have the lights off. And then Dwayne D. Nice was asking, well, what mode will they be in? So we will run them through their most accurate mode, right? Filmmaker movie mode, the mode that most consumers assume is the best mode. Because when a consumer turns on a TV, they look through different modes. Oh, movie mode. I watch movies. I'll put in movie mode. And fortunately, today, TV brands, actually, it makes sense. The word movie mode, oh, movies, filmmaker. Okay, I know what filmmaker is, puts that on. And so that's what we'll do. But then also, we're going to have sports content. So standard mode, dynamic mode in sports most of the content we'll be showing will be streaming content as well. A lot of people today, I know there are some people that buy Blu-ray. We will have a Blu-ray player there just to show them what Blu-ray looks like, but more often than not, they're gonna ask for us to put in our Fire Stick, Roku Stick, whatever. They wanna see what YouTube looks like, what Netflix looks like. What does Netflix Dolby Vision on that TV looks like, right? And that is actually a bigger difference. Running Netflix Dolby Vision on whatever Sony that's there against an LG, against a Samsung, which doesn't have Dolby Vision, you're going to have three different images. And I don't know if calibration is going to make a difference on any of them, because we know the Sony, <laughs> calibrated or not, Dolby Vision, Netflix on the Sony is not going to look anything like the one on the LG, calibrated or not. And even they're both calibrated, the Sony will look different. And the Samsung doesn't even have Dolby Vision. And my goal is to tell people, look, does it even matter? Because Samsung doesn't have Dolby Vision. You're streaming Netflix. How does it look to you? Oh, it looks great. Okay, then don't worry about it. But a lot of people don't know that. I get so many questions. I can't get a Samsung because it doesn't have Dolby Vision. And I'm like, like, okay, I put out a video that's coming out tomorrow. Do people know that LG G just cut out Dolby Vision from two more of its models this year? The QNED 85T. I did not know that. And yeah, and the 8090. The 8090 is a seven thousand dollar, 98 inch TV. It has one of their best dimming zone algorithms, the precision dimming. So it's a premium TV, no Dolby Vision. The 85T has full vertical dimming, right? And it starts at 900 for the smallest size, up to 2700 for the 85, 86 inch, no Dolby Vision. And they started last year taking away Dolby Vision from their kind of lower QNED models. 
they're working their way up and I know why. It's expensive to tune Dolby Vision because Sony's still not getting it right with Dolby Vision. That means they're putting, and Sony reached out to me and says, look, we're working on it. Tell everyone, A95L Dolby Vision will be fixed. But guess what? That's money out of your pocket they're going to pass that cost on to you to get Dolby Vision right. And this is why Hisense Dolby Vision doesn't look great. They don't care. They just slap the Dolby Vision chip in, whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. If they mm -hmm. were to spend the time to make Dolby Vision look as good as HDR10, how much is that going to cost on a, a, a TCL $250 S4? It's a $250 TV. It has Dolby Vision. Do you want it to be a $300 TV to have a better Dolby Vision? I'd rather it not have Dolby Vision at all. So it goes back to what I want to show the audience when they get there, you know, on site, oh, wow, Dolby Vision doesn't make a difference at all so that it doesn't give them stress because not many people know which TV model you get, the Dolby Vision experience will be different. So clarification again, this is not typically what we do. I would say it's not really an objective comparison. Mm -mm. Would you agree with that? This is very Absolutely. subjective. And I think this is where... D nice, you're getting a little bit led astray. This is not meant to be an objective comparison. This is meant for people to determine subjectively what they like, right? Because most people don't care about a calibration. They're never going to get one. So if you put a TV that's not doing well and it needs to be calibrated to show what it can really do, if the guy's never going to do a calibration, he's never going to see that anyway. So he needs to be able to choose what TV he likes out of the box and go that direction. Maybe he doesn't want to spend $2,000 or $3,000 or $4,000 on the best TV possible. He's just going to choose what subjectively he likes. This isn't a shootout. This isn't us trying to figure out what the best TV is. This isn't us trying to figure out you know, who's doing the best at whatever. This is simply allowing people to see what do you like and allow them to have knowledge so when they go make their own buying decision they can do that and to have somebody like fomo there to guide them through that with knowledge that's what this is and then somebody sa said uh well why don't you just have a calibrated uncalibrated mode well i can tell you that if any of the calibrators would like to volunteer their time to come out mm -hmm. for almost a full week to do these calibrations i will gladly allow you to do that justin D jason dustel did that last year and I'm not the guy to do that. Like I can calibrate, but I'm not the guy that's going to say, Hey, this is how it should be. So if any of the calibrators want to be able to do that, absolutely have at it. Nice ass. Yeah. What's the point of having a reference mode there? You mean the reference monitor? Well, that's just to show this is how supposedly it should look. This is what you're looking at. Do you like how it should look or do you like what you're looking at? Again, subjective. There's no objective way, right or wrong way around this. It's about what you as an individual like. We are a culmination of our life experiences, right? No one is going to like the same thing. Most people don't like reference. They like something else. So why not allow them to buy based on something else? That's what we're trying to allow them to do. And to your point, Ryan, last year, the number one question I had was, so I want to see what an OLED looks compared to a non-OLED. They just wanted to see the difference. And they, okay, this is a QM8. This is not an OLED. Here's the A95K. Here's the G3. And they're like, huh, they look so similar. And that actually ends up being the comparison that I'm going to get most of the time is 98 inch LCD. That's a 83 inch or a 77 inch OLED. And I will explain it. Okay, this is infinite contrast in a dark room. They put in these scenes. They're going to look at OLED versus non-OLED, but they're not even noticing the accuracy differences. It's the infinite contrast against a mini LED. And that's what we're going to get as questions more often than not, because that's exactly what happened last year. Hey, what's this mini LED mean? Brian, I spent half the time explaining OLED, mini LED, mm -hmm. LCD, and then they go, oh, and I said, well, see this QMA? Although it looks similar, look what happens when I turn on the lights. Oh my God, I can't see anything. There's like this horrible glare. I go, and that's why you get the G3, because forget that it's OLED, it has a better anti-glare, right? Or the Sony. And it ends up that ends up being the deal breaker, not even the image quality, because the QM8 had terrible anti-glare. It didn't have any at all, right? So when I turned on the light, all you saw was my shirt, and you could barely see that image. And so it, it's a lot of, of what we call um, life experience in terms of quality of life. When I own this TV, Am I going to enjoy that TV? And it doesn't even get to the color accuracy. And I just wanted to 
answer this question real quick. Grouch says, hey, Fomo, you should have calibrators on a calibrated TV stream. So I do that once a year, is I bring in Sammy, and sometimes uh, the, the Matt, another local calibrator, comes by, and they sit there and spend time calibrating six of my TVs, and we talk about it. It's like a mm -hmm. nine-hour stream. They wow. go over what they like, what they don't like. We start at 8, 9 a.m. We end at 8, 9 p.m., and by <laughs> the end, you guys know exactly before That's or after true. we go over the numbers, and then ultimately, based on that, then I start generating reviews because I have the calibrators here. Who did the TVs? All the troubles they had. Like Sammy refuses to ever calibrate another TCL again because it was <laughs> so hard. And even wow. then, he couldn't get it accurate. Yet Jason's QMate, perfectly accurate, goes, wow, I've never seen such an accurate TCL ever, right? So definitely, there was a panel lottery there. But yeah, there is a stream and a venue for everything. That's my venue because i enjoy talking to calibrators but at i know at m wave that is not the audience they're still trying to understand the difference between an oled a mini led and an lcd tv without mini led but then you get size i go okay well this is 98 inch but it's not mini led and this is an oled that's two sizes smaller here is six, you know six, seven feet away which one do you like forget the word calibration that is what they're looking at size versus image quality infinite contrast in a dark room. let me turn on the lights is this bright enough now and so when we go through all of that that's already like 30 minutes of comparisons without even caring about color accuracy i like this comment i just put it up where'd it go this one, right, same one. listen to these buffoons <laughs> Sorry for the French. Then the manufacturers Steve. should make TV sets as cheap as possible as the average consumer could care less. That in no way is what we're saying. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding that's going on here and what's happening. Like I personally, I love the Sony XR A95L in the 65 and the 77. It's a phenomenal TV. Stupid bright, infinite blacks, amazing picture. It's amazing. I put it next to the TCL. The TCL looks like crap. Mm -hmm. The point here is that not everybody is going to have the budget for that. They're not going to like filmmaker mode. It's not necessarily that we're saying people don't like that mode. It's that most people aren't going to calibrate. So why are we calibrating these displays? That's what's cut, what this is coming down to. Um, I mean, if you guys disagree with us, have a, con a constructive conversation about it. There's a lot of... I don't know why this is happening. There's a lot of just... <laughs> angst and disagreement but no objective comments about why you think we're wrong mm -hmm. it's just hey you're an idiot you need to fix this <laughs> and not really providing any context into why so mm -hmm. if you got something and disagree provide reasons why i can't change or have a constructive conversation with you if you don't provide those or that information anyway and i and i think it's also important to understand where we come from so each of us as youtubers creators or reviewers so for me i end up not being really a technical reviewer along the sense of this tv is technically superior because abc but rather this tv is good for you because it matches your use case and this is why and as i do more and more of that there is less Usually. of i mean like no, this Sony is great for you because it has great processing to help with your cable feed, right? Because Sony does a good job with that. But And its skin tones are pretty good out of the box. Or I came from a Sony. I'm used to Sony colors. Give me a Sony TV. Very rarely is there one where they say, if I calibrate one of these TVs, which one should I get? Because more often than not, I'm always assuming they don't calibrate their TVs. And so even my editor's choice, the S90C, it wasn't I wasn't saying, oh, this TV is really accurate out of the box because all the TVs I review look pretty good in filmmaker mode, filmmaker mode out of the box. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately it ends up being a use case, size, brightness, glare, features, gaming. And rarely is there, well, this calibrates really well because they all calibrate well. All the mm -hmm. TVs that I review now, today, maybe five years ago, not, but today, if you choose to calibrate, it's going to calibrate great. So what would it's the you little say, things. What would you say from the filmmaker mode? How close are they already? Like how much are you getting of a deviation going from like a uncalibrated Sony or LG, the OLEDs to like, you're going from filmmaker uncalibrated to calibrated. How close are they? 
they are close. Okay, so I'll, I'll just use my Sony A95L as an example before it was calibrated. Uh, definitely, the skin tones on it before calibration was a little bit rich, but mm -hmm. after calibrated, but then I'm a reviewer. It, it looks so like I'm so used to all these scenes, right? Mm -hmm. I watch the same movies and whatever, but mm -hmm. it still looked natural. Just, oh, you know, that's a little bit richer than I'm used to. And then after calibration, okay, that's what I'm used to. But each TV is going to be either it's always a red push in my opinion like the, mm -hmm. the lgs have been that little green push for whatever reason slightly too green even after calibration it looks a little slightly too green and on the sony's there's that little extra red or magenta right but sometimes i forget wait reviewers see tvs so many TVs. We are so used to our material that we're mm -hmm. sensitive to the slight changes just like you guys when you listen to the same track wait is it rolling off too early at the 30 hertz i mean you guys could tell the difference between 35 hertz roll off 25 hertz and 40 because you're listening to that track all the time every reviewers it's the same thing hey that specular highlight it's missing right and so i have to take a step back for that consumer what is he really looking at i try to extrapolate the value for him but if he's already there and now we're talking about these little things then we could get into it but to your point about how far off is it in the past Lips used to be really magenta, and I have to get it calibrated. A Vizio, a TCL, a Hisense, now they're getting better. Whereas Samsung, Sony, and LG in filmmaker mode, they're pretty good. I, 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 now I tell people, look, if you are, try in filmmaker mode, if it looks unnatural, get it calibrated. If it looks good to you, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. You know, it's, and I, people are saying, well, there was a comment, something about calibration and stuff or why get them calibrated at all or something like that, or the calibration is necessary. But as Foma was saying, I don't remember what the comment was, but as Foma was saying, I mean, the TVs have gotten to the point that they're pretty darn good. They're not perfect. Good. Will a professional calibration improve them? Absolutely. For sure. Uh, that's a funny comment. After a couple of swigs, <laughs> a beer bottle, beer bottle of glasses, oh, my friend. Oh, <laughs> oh man. And I, but I've said this multiple times. How far do you want to chase the rabbit? Sure. Right. Yeah. How much are you willing to spend in the chase of perfection? Right. Some are. Is, yeah, some exactly. Are. And that's the thing. We all have to determine what, you know, what extreme, what level we want to go, you know, and that, whether that's subwoofers, whether it's calibration, whether it's, you know, taking it to that nth degree. There are some people that will make an upgrade on an automobile to get 3% improvement in performance to shave off, you know, um, a fraction of a second on mm -hmm. a quarter mile. Okay. That's you. That's awesome. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And there's value in that. Not everybody needs that. And what we're trying to do at M wave is just honestly really cater to the majority of people. The majority yeah. of customers aren't getting their TVs yeah. calibrated, whether it's a $3,000 TV. They certainly aren't getting a, a $700 TV calibrated for an additional whatever it costs, $300, $500, $700,000, whatever you charge. Um, so we're just trying to make it as applicable. One of the goals of M-Wave is to provide experiences that just bring value to our customers, to the people that come. This the is people a that this is a really good comment. And we actually mentioned this at the beginning of the stream. So what's one? happening is most consumers can't tell the difference because they don't have a reference at home to compare. We talk about this all the time. 100%. Not even on this stream, but in multiple aspects of home theater and really life in general. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss. There is a reason that mm -hmm. saying exists. And in this context, it can save you a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. So one gentleman, the guy that called me a buffoon earlier, and he, he's right <laughs> that I love once, it. <laughs> once you understand and you see calibrated and you put it next to the uncalibrated, you will see the difference. That yes, is not what we're, we're not saying that you're not going to see a difference. We're not Correct. saying that there's, you know, not a reason to professionally calibrate a TV. Absolutely. What Absolutely. we're saying is most people and I tell my customers this with projectors all the time because I try and put my relationships first. What we're saying is that are you, if you're not going to have a reference next to it, like a calibrated reference point next to it, and you're not chasing the rabbit, mm -hmm. will you ever know what you have to establish the baseline 
of what is good enough for you. And that bar is different for every person, right? My projector and my theater room, absolutely 100% calibrated every day of the week, no questions, mm -hmm. right? But I don't care with the TVs. So it's really important, I think, for everybody to understand, and this comment is really important, that what we're trying to highlight here is that calibration absolutely makes a difference. But yeah. for the Joe Schmo, they're not going to have a calibrated reference point. Probably don't want to spend extra money because they really just care about a big TV. And I'm not targeting necessarily anybody in, yeah. in chat, but they just care about a big image that looks cool, that can watch football or whatever on. And that's it. What TV has the features, options, and different things that they need to make their life better. And we want to be able to showcase that and talk about it in depth. Now, we will absolutely talk about calibration because I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't care about that. Mm -hmm. I would like to have somebody made this comment earlier mm -hmm. about well, why don't you have a TVs that are calibrated and TVs that are uncalibrated so that we can, you know, shut this whole debate down. I would love to do that. But unfortunately, like last year, I'm probably fronting a lot of the equipment that's going to be at M-Wave. I think last year I was in over $200,000 in equipment. So mm -hmm. unless somebody has a bunch of TVs that they're willing to donate for this event, and we are working with manufacturers and stuff, um, it becomes really difficult to be able to yeah. do, to put them side by side. These are all things that we would love to do, yeah. but um, I don't have infinitely deep pockets to be able to, to do that. So I have to trim some fat if if you will sometimes so, so sammy says sammy says out of the box tv is crap would you agree or disagree <laughs> it's not crap okay it's not okay it may not be first of all what tv the definition TV, of crap right? though is subjective i mean one subjective. person may think we talked about the three percent that you were talking about earlier right three percent mm. somebody may see that if it's under three percent they're like oh it still looks like crap and if it's over three percent they'd be like i can't tell the difference I was actually in a room with, I was doing an on-site demo for MadVR. For anyone who doesn't know, I work for MadVR. MadVR does a bunch of amazing things with tone mapping, with black bar um, removal, with AI-based motion interpolation, a bunch of other stuff. Um, and I was doing an on-site demo for a dealer. And we were doing things to an end user, right? So I wasn't dealing with dealers. I was talking to an end user. And to everybody in the room that worked in the AV world, the changes that MadVR was making were blatant, like in your face. To the customer, no idea. Like they couldn't <laughs> see it. And right. I was watching the image go like this as it stuttered with motion and interpolation yeah. off. And then it was like this with it on. And the guy was like, I can't see it. I don't see the difference. <laughs> yeah. and I, but this is a perfect point to this that, I think a lot of people get in this position of we're so used to seeing things certain way that it could be, and I'm speaking kind of devil's advocate here. It can be kind of difficult to see things from the average consumer's point of view when they mm. don't really care a lot of times. Could they care if they were educated? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But most people aren't going to take the time to educate them. And most of those consumers don't care enough to be educated yeah. on that topic. Yeah. And well, I want to pull back the title because I don't want it to make it sound like the title is clickbait. The title of the stream is Calibrated TV Reviews, Useful or Misleading? So we know why they're useful. So all the fans know why calibration is useful. I want to repeat why to me it could be misleading, which is this. If you take a TV that if it wasn't calibrated, it would just say it would be crap. But once it's calibrated, it looks great. And now I'm just praising this TV. Wow, because I'm comparing it to a calibrated TV. It's calibrated. The other TV is calibrated. The other TV is a Sony A95L $4,000 TV. This is a TCL $900 TV. I calibrate it. Now it looks amazing. I always have to at some point repeat. But remember, I calibrated it. I spent $500 on it. That's, that's going to get lost. They're going to say, that's an amazing TCL. It compared to the Sony, that's the misleading part. Mm -hmm. I did not intend to mislead them. But I don't know how many times people watch a 20-minute review. Even if I peppered it every three minutes, it was calibrated. Mm -hmm. They don't hear that. They hear, TCL, good as a Sony A95L. I'm going for it. And then, it, oh, this doesn't look great at all. FOMO, you said, I go, dude, I spent $500 calibrating that TV. And so... Would it have been better to review the TV uncalibrated next to the Sony and have the Sony uncalibrated as well and say, look, this is the difference. Like, oh, wow, yeah, that does. The skin tones are totally off, blah, blah, blah. 
the, or I have to do two reviews, right? TCL mm -hmm. yeah. uncalibrated against the Sony, TCL calibrated against the mm -hmm. Sony, and even then people will watch the calibrate and come after me and I'll say, no, no, watch the uncalibrated because you don't plan to calibrate your TV. Well, I can't I, win. I'm, I'm, and that's the misleading yeah. part. People mm -hmm. shopping in the G3A95L, they're mm -hmm. also hoping to spend money and not calibrate. Right, Ryan? I mean, when you spend up there, you're like, wait, I spent 3000 I have to spend another 500 Why am I spending 3000 I mean, right? In all honesty, a lot of to a lot of people, the word calibration doesn't even cross their mind. And mm -hmm. if you mention it as a custom integrator, they're not going to want to spend another $500 mm -hmm. or $1,000 or however much it's going to cost. Some people will, but Joe Schmo, not going to. Yeah. So... D nice brings up a point. He says, "What's the purpose of using a reference monitor?" It just moved, um, and or changing the TV out of its out of the box mode if M Wave is about the quote average customer. So we keep the TV and it's out of the box mode, which is the basics. Here are your settings: movie, standard, whatever. The people visiting they get to play with the remote. So it's it's a very so I guess people need to understand kind of interactive. I guess it's yeah. interactive, right? they're there they're not just sitting in the audience and i'm like you know going through a tour they get to play with the remote and say hey what if i do this i go yeah 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 it goes well you know what i have a problem with my tv what's your problem okay this is what i do boom 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 and i show them oh this is what we did oh, okay that makes sense mm -hmm. and i told them look i can make the lg look just like the samsung this is what i do boom 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 because as reviewers we know the tv settings so well that we can help them i have a samsung at home how do i make it look more like that sony oh you need to do this so really it's an interactive way to better understand your tv because most people i found out they don't want to touch the settings right mm -mm. i want the people visiting mwave there is a value i mean they paid a ticket what some people do to right? settings though and what the image looks like after they mess with settings <laughs> <laughs> how do i get it back right where'd and my so, image go why is everybody green you know and that's another thing i want to be able to reset the tv if they screwed it up and what did you do again if right. i calibrate it i i can't reset it I, I can't go in there and go this is for the consumer who doesn't mind reset oh you know i screwed up i don't know what i screwed up let's reset it and try it again yeah. it, it is for the 80 percent right but let's say 90 percent is being too aggressive the 80 mm. percent definitely don't care but they do want to make their tv look a little bit better they attend m wave to interact with the tv with me as their guide because i'm there to say look whatever tv you buy i can try to get that tv as close to an oled as possible this is what you do i can get the oled as bright as possible but this is what you lose so the it's reason a tour. the reason in my opinion that i want the reference monitor there is because i want people to be able to see how it was intended to look right or as close to that as i can now you're still kind of getting into subjective ism with the calibrator i think every calibrator has their own subjective tastes on what they mm -hmm. think um how close they are and all that um is there going to be de visual deviation i don't know i'm just playing again devil's advocate here but the reason for the mastering monitor is to give people the show of this is how it should look which one do you like more? And honestly, I hope that people would say, I want it this way and how it was right, intended, right. right? Because that's how I like it. But we want to give people the option, right? So yeah. if they like that, we can then say, well, then you could make that over here. You just need a calibration, right? That's the important part here is to showcase the whole gamut and not just say, you have to do this way or you have to do this way. <laughs> Right. We want to showcase everything so that people are armed with knowledge so that when they go in, they can make their own decisions instead mm -hmm. of basing their decision on mine or somebody else's opinion. Sure. And, and the it reality, may not be opinion, but yeah, and the reality, Sammy, you know, you say M Wave will put calibrators out of business. It shouldn't. No. I hope I they, hope that's not what we're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, that's not the purpose of it. If we have a calibrated monitor. And you've got a TV out of the box. And if the TV out of the box looks horrendous compared to the calibrated monitor, shouldn't that drive traffic to calibrators? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, to your point, they see the calibrated TV, they go, wow, I really like that D65 mm -hmm. white, whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to, it's true, you have to spend some time with a calibrated image to get a feel for what the creator intended. Not everything is supposed to be bright white, pushing blue, right? And 
it allows them to see, okay, this is creator's intent. How far is it off is it? Because what I like about calibration personally, color of the skin tones, right? The natural skin tones. That mm -hmm. it's a combination of white balance and red. I'm very sensitive to skin warmth, as all of us are, right? When you see a face that is even slightly off, it's unwatchable. And I watch a lot of movies where, you know, facial close-ups and all that. For me, the calibration is for the skin tones, not for the blue sky, not for the greener grass, right? And so when we show content with a lot of faces, that's when the monitor pops. It's not when I show was it Pacific Rim? You're going to hate the calibrated mode. <laughs> Pacific Rim, you're going to want saturated, dynamic mode, whatever. So it's not Pacific Rim that's going to sell people on the calibration. It's going to be things like Amsterdam, things where it's close up of the face, right? And we'll have those as well. And so that's how calibrators make their money is getting the skin tones right, I think. So Dwayne asks, Ryan, all of this is technically going to be about your opinion if this comparison will be more about subjectivity than objective. I don't provide my opinion. I, I try and be very careful about what I say and don't say because I want people to formulate their own decisions. Right, I'm not even going to be running that room. FOMO is. I know. So, I'm. I'm here to take. I'm here to take the hits, my friends. It's. It's. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I try and provide people guidance by asking them questions so that they can come to their own conclusions about what they want and what they don't want. Um, and I'm also very careful about my vendors, right? So this isn't a shootout. This is a comparison and mm -hmm. it allows people to formulate their own decisions. I mean, is it any better than what Best Buy does? I don't know, but it's definitely got people that are educated to be able to answer questions while they're viewing things. And Best Buy, as long as we can get one, doesn't have a mastering monitor there to be able to do direct A-B comparisons. So I'm not probably even going to have time to go into that room. Um, I try and not provide my opinions. I just allow people to come to their own conclusions because I think it comes to better end results with happier customers when they guide, when they're the guide on their own journey instead of me doing it for them. I'll answer questions for them like technical stuff or push them off to somebody if I don't know, but mm -hmm. you got to be the guide of your own journey in order to make it the, you have the best outcome. Well, it's, it's in your name. M wave is experience. Mm -hmm. I want it to be an experience. It's not one way. It's not me telling you what something I'll is, like but sure. rather, sure. right. It's an experience like, Hey, what is it you guys watch? Mm -hmm. Here are different TVs. Here's an OLED. Here's a mini LED. Here's an LCD. Do you see differences? Nope. They get the LCD. Now, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that experience. FOMO, you're going to have them change modes, I would assume, correct? So they can see yeah, all the different yeah. modes and how the Because they're going to want sports. And every time we put up sports, oh my gosh, this sports, I don't like it in this mode. It's oftentimes they don't even know what mode to be put in to watch sports. I mean, it says sports, but they don't even know that's there, right? So mm -hmm. I don't think because our audience, our meaning the a lot of people watching, both yours and mine, I think are sophisticated enthusiasts in the AV space, whether it's projectors or TVs, they know more than 99%, honestly. I mean, the fact that they go from movie mode to standard, if they know what dynamic tone mapping is, that puts them ahead of the curve, like when to turn it on or off, or even what tone mapping does, or even what HDR is, just having that knowledge puts them in that 1%. I think M-Wave, a lot of people they're just trying to discover okay i'm going to spend a thousand dollars and to them that's a lot of money what are the technologies available to me today and they're going to come in there and that's the tour i'm giving them i'm not this is not the same level at a shootout like the one in new york city we're doing and classy our calibrators that is highly technical i mean we're, we're, we're down in the dirt right we're, we're yeah. in the granular level where they're calling the guys at sony and lg technical and yelling at them hey this is wrong right here we're nowhere close i'm just trying to teach people the differences why is oled more expensive this is mm -hmm. why turn off the lights turn on the lights why is mini led you know it's the same price then why should i get a mini led this is why mm -hmm. and none of that discussion ever even touches oh this is because it's more accurate they just want to see why they should get one technology one size like we're going to tape everything out so they could oh this is 60 degree viewing angle i'm you know nine feet away from a 100 inch tv let's say right whatever that viewing angle becomes so i'm going to tape everything up so that they can experience sitting seating distance viewing angles what i think is the fundamentals of tv watching before they even get to the question 
oh, by the way, are these TVs calibrated? If they ever ask that question, they're already ahead of the 99% that's going to be there. So, it, that, and that's a different discussion we could always have too. All right, Jonathan, I'm putting you on the spot because somebody mentioned enthusiasts are going to want objective comparisons. What are your thoughts? I know you kind of talked about this at the beginning, but what are your thoughts on objective versus subjective? And you actually did this with the Epson and the JVC. And that was, I think there was a decent amount of subjectivity. Not, And there was also, I think, a lot of subjectivity in your own audio calibration. So I'm going to rewind the conversation and answer to your question a little bit what FOMO said previously. You get them calibrated in, as, as is the traditional thing at these things. And then you play these clips, these niche clips that nobody ever watches in real world, like the 1917 staircase scene <laughs> or the it basement scene where there's two sets of eyes and you're, yeah. and you're looking, you're pixel peeping and you're trying to see like, Oh, this one has a little leg up, mm -hmm. but that's not what we watch. And at so all. To, to Ryan's point, what he's bringing up is I, you know, those projector shootouts, when you watch that kind of content, and this is going to get probably pretty specific again, when you watch that kind of content, the JVC has the best black for, period. No question asked. It does the best on that kind of content. Oh, it dominates. But when you put real world content, like you put your mm -hmm. streaming stick in there, or you put your sports on, or you watch YouTube, and you have, I mean, I've done this so many times in my room, you have the nz7 and the epson ls 12000 side by side and you're sitting in the room here and you have them just both playing it's not nearly as clear which one wins as compared to that torture test content now just to be clear if you went up and pixel peeped and found you can find things it's we're not saying that you can't measure or find the differences it's just that to the naked eye when you're looking from a viewing position 10 12 15 feet back, it is really hard to be able to see these differences. And so I think that's what FOMO was saying with like the Spears and Munsell content. You can like, you can go to that nth degree, but that's not how we use our theaters. It's just really not. And so in those same comparisons, like when you go to those shootouts and I, there's going to be people light up on this. So zip up my flame suit here. <laughs> you, you go to these shootouts and it's a one way ticket. You that's know, the funny. ones that are, that are real objective, they're that, Everything is extremely calibrated and extremely detailed. JVC wins it, period. Mm -hmm. No question. Everybody who doesn't think the JVC wins it is an idiot. That's that's the that's the turnaround from that. Meanwhile, in my room, I bought the LS12000 and the JVC, and I've done a half dozen shootouts down here with 20 people. And in the normal viewing content stuff, the majority, I'd say two-thirds by the number, two-thirds of the people have liked the Epson LS12000 on real-world content. So what what do you what do you make of that? It's kind of what FOMO was talking about. Like maybe people like a little bit more saturated picture. Maybe people like a little bit brighter image. You know, when you don't when you don't calibrate them all down and and get that exact same level, it's more of an out of the box type picture mode. Oh, I, I, it's almost the same thing. Are we doing a favor by saying the JVC is technically the most accurate when you really dial it in? Or are you doing a favor saying the Epson's the more accurate when the more people like out of the box? When you're comparing them out of the box, more people like the Epson in my room, period. I mean, that is that that is the outcome of this shootout many times. Yep. So, so where does that, I mean, where, what's the more accurate way to represent? Do people go out and get these projectors calibrated, these TVs calibrated, as it were? The answer is no. So the side by side where you're just using daily content and just using them like how people use them might well they do it's, it's a very the minority do to clarify sure sure so i mean it's it's interesting conversation i for my part i kind of fall in the more of like i'm not going to sit there and watch that 1917 staircase scene over and over again and that's such a rarity in the content that i do watch it'd be mm -hmm. like 1% of 1% of 1% of the content that I run across that we're using as exclusive clips for these shootouts. And it doesn't mm -hmm. make a whole lot of sense to me. It never has. I've said that before on many occasions. So I, I'm on board with what you guys are saying. Like, it makes sense to me. Use them more like how people use them. Watch the content people use. Watch the modes people use. Let's see how they do. That's interesting, Aaron. Uh, I want to address Aaron's request because it's very interesting how about more expensive tv not calibrated versus 
more affordable TV being calibrated. What's going to end up happening is the more expensive TV is an OLED and the less expensive TV yeah. is the LCD. After you calibrate the LCD, it doesn't make a difference, <laughs> right? You guys know the infinite <laughs> contrast will destroy the, the – so calibration, it, it is – okay, I like calibration. I want my TVs calibrated because I, I, I am sensitive to bad skin tone. Okay, but – if you look at a TV, an expensive TV that's not calibrated and the skin tone slightly off, but you see the infinite contrast, right? The perfect blacks, the perfect, near perfect contrast. And then the less expensive TV might have the slightly better skin tones, but then it's washed out. You're, you're going to be drawn to the infinite contrast and you, then you're going to hire a calibrator to work on the more expensive TV. You cannot watch a washed out TV when there is an infinite contrast there. And that's the M wave, the experience is to see OLED versus non OLED. The calibration is that last level. Once once you've decided you want an OLED, then you can decide whether you should get it calibrated. But you don't decide whether or not to calibrate before you decide whether you get an OLED or a mini LED TV. If that makes sense, right? So I, I see where Aaron's going, but you're going to end up choosing the more expensive technology before you get to the calibration part. Wow, interesting. Anything else to add? That was quite the discussion. This is a fun conversation. Though. We should bring so, FOMO more. So I've just, never seen so much like controversy <laughs> in the chats as tonight. I love oh, it. Well, I live well, on this. Welcome to my yeah, streams, is, my friend. <laughs> and here's the thing, though. I mean, we can enjoy a peaceful conversation like this and have differences of opinions, and that's awesome. The last thing we want is everybody thinking exactly the way that we think. Mm -hmm. We're just sharing our reasoning behind what we've chosen to do for this year's M wave. Does that mean it'll stay that way every year? We don't know. I mean, we're only three years into M wave. And so nobody's doing this. Like we're the, I mean, yes, there are other shootouts out there. Nobody's doing what we're doing at M wave. Um, we're yep. literally blazing our own trail. Trying right or to wrong. We may be on fire at times, but yeah, you know, we're, it we're, is trying what it is. To, we're trying to provide an event that is super relational, like extremely relational. Um, we're trying to provide an event that allows consumers to see and experience things they literally can't get <laughs> anywhere else. Some why, people, real you know, quick, why does this not surprise me with Scott? Like <laughs> wait, wait, how, yeah, or how, how loud are this? OLED. <laughs> So now we use the LED in the family room. Is this a, a 21 inch dual 21 inch? The, no, the, this is quad 18s with oh, eight yeah. 10 inch mids. Yeah. And then a 21 inch wave guy. Right on. behind his OLED. I mean, it's like it, it he, shook. Almost, the if, you remember from, if you remember from um, M Wave 2022, these were the speakers <laughs> that were in my garage. Oh, those things are massive. Like yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was he trying to hit yeah. SPL, yeah. like 105 SPLs with know. his earmuffs Scott, on? Did it fall <laughs> off your mantle or fall off the wall? What happened? Yeah. I need I need enlightenment. Well, you know what he did? He probably bumped up the base below 60, right? Raised it by another 12 SPLs, and then there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Super fun. Uh, All right. You well, ready to get to comments? Just to Ryan's point, I, the reason why we do this is because of the name. It's the Midwest AV Experience. There are shootouts. This is why it's not called a shootout, right? I'm not calling this a shootout. I don't think anyone has called this a shootout. Mm -hmm. It's a demonstration. It's a experience where you get to experience technologies and sizes. And now, if this doesn't do well, like you said, Next year, we might have it all calibrated. We might you have to put it in expensive. Right? <clears throat> this is not in stone. It's yeah. just last yeah. year, everything was calibrated. And I want a chance to try and see what would happen. Would it be any different if we saved money and expense and time and resources from calibrating and have one calibrated panel, whether that's mm -hmm. an actual reference monitor or just a very good TV that's calibrated either way, and see how that goes so that people can compare it because we, we get feedback from the people attending. So this is for the attendance, right? Unlike a shootout where it's kind of like mm -hmm. global, you're broadcasting, everyone's questioning what's happening, right? You, ha you have to have your I's and T's crossed. People attending I'm serving them. So if they show up telling me, well, well, you know what? I would rather it was calibrated. If I have five people say that, hey, you know what? That's <laughs> enough for me. Ryan, let's start saving up. I'm going to have to try and get a couple of these calibrated next year. But if most people come to me and say, it's okay to have one so that we see what it looks like, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. 
it, it's up to the people that attend. So those of you mm. who want calibrated TVs, all of them, please show up and, and tell me, you know what? This is useless to me. Get it calibrated, damn it. And then they mm -hmm. spent all that money to father to tell me that, you know what? You earned that that point right that's worth 10 votes to me so it's mm -hmm. we're trying something different because yeah. shootouts globally are everywhere they're yeah. all calibrated to different degrees all of, of right why not have it something different and this yeah. is not claiming to be a shootout it's not mm -hmm. and it's not awarding a winner that's another thing there is no yeah. judging no right trophy. Yeah. There is, there is, it's all like Dwayne said, this is subjective, but yeah. subjective to your preference to technologies and sizes. I'm not entering, I'm like, okay, you want natural skin tones? This looks weird, doesn't it? Well, look at that reference TV. That's mm -hmm. calibrated. That's yeah. what it looks like. So this TV could look like that. And I can guarantee you it'll come very close. You need to get it calibrated. If you want to save money, get this TCL. It's this much. Spend another five hundred dollars. What city are you in? Let's call Classy right now. Hey, when are you going to be in that city? All right. He's got a client. Boom. Now it's going to look very close to this reference TV or monitor. So that is also available too. That's why we'll always have at least one display there that's calibrated. Mm -hmm. So out of curiosity, but it's yeah. an experience. And Michael. If we need it to be calibrated next year, absolutely. I, yeah. But we got to try something different, you know. Yeah. Uh, the way I've always looked at anything in life is get out of your comfort zone, try something different. You can always go back to what you've always done before if it doesn't work out. And, you know, from day one, you know, three years ago when we started in wave, we wanted, we didn't want to, the goal wasn't to recreate a trade show. There are plenty of shows out there that are amazing. They're fun. They're great. We want to provide something that is a truly unique experience something that folks uh, focuses on building relationships, lasting friendships. We're doing some things this year that will <clears throat> provide even better opportunities for you to connect with other people that are in your area and, uh, you know, and then provide some side-by-side -side comparisons. The reality is, um, you know, when these groups do a shootout, it's not available to the mass public. Like we're running out a part of a convention center saying whoever wants to come, come and hang out with us. Hey, and if somebody wants to do a room where they calibrate all the TVs. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. hundred percent. Be totally up to that. So some of you calibrators. Do I it. You may get 300 <laughs> new caliber, four or 500 new guys wanting to book you for a calibration. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Should we answer some questions? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to do the Super Chats. I know some of you guys are like, hey, you missed the Super Chats. We didn't. What I try to do, and some of you guys are, are from FOMO's channel, so typically on the AV experience, what we like to do is stay on topic for the first whatever portion. If it's 30 minutes, 45 minutes, hour, whatever. Here it's hour 20. Um, and that way it's just congruent. We're not like all over the place. Then once we get done with the topic, then we go back Super Chats, then we go through a list of a bunch of things that we've started, and we've got quite a few of those. So we're going to jump right into it. Let me scroll up here. So Bruce, appreciate the $2 Super Chat. His question was a little bit down here. He says, hey, can you recommend a good 4K Dolby Atmos demo disc that I can purchase from Amazon or eBay, one that isn't expensive and will really show off my speakers and powered subwoofers? Any suggestions? Mm. Typically, Bruce, the, the demo disc that you're talking about Dolby Atmos, DTS, um, those types of things, <clears throat> Oro 3D, those are not available for resale. So you can't just go and buy them from a website. Now, granted, some people get them from, let's say, Cedia, or they get them from a dealer or from a brand or something like that, and they have a connection in the AV industry, and then they'll take that and turn around and sell that on eBay. So sometimes you can find that. Just Google um, Dolby Atmos demo disc or... Uh, DTS demo disc on like eBay. The downside of that is sometimes those are bootleg copies. And so you're just not guaranteed. So just kind of take that with caution. You may get a, a burnt DVD. Lance. Oh, actually, let me come back to you, Lance. I saw another super chat down here. Christian, appreciate the $10 super chat. He says, I saw Dune part two. Let me know in the comments if you saw Dune part two. I know a lot of you guys are hyped about that and went to see that this weekend. I think Shane Lee uh, posted a video. I think he even watched it in Dolby Cinema as well as in um, 
IMAX and he did a, a video on that. So check out his channel. <clears throat> he said, I saw Dune part two in the Dolby cinema. It was life changing. Bass shook the room, my chair and me, the sound was excellent, but I couldn't hear any Atmos effects. I want to build something like that at home. So did any yeah. of you four see, you know, me? I didn't. Hey, I did. You know, I was on the slopes, baby. Can I address the Dolby Cinema where it shook the room? Christian, how much of that shaking was your chair? Because I'm mm. pretty certain that the subwoofer yeah. in Adobe Cinema is not qualified to go below even 35, right, Ryan? Mm -hmm. I mean, the amount of energy and power and the number of subwoofers to pressurize Adobe Cinema mm -hmm. is more expensive and more power consuming than that theater could handle. So that's why they installed the shaky seats. Because uh, mm -hmm. I spoke to a couple of Adobe guys. Like, yeah, yeah, no, the shaky seats just to give you that. So I agree Tag with you. You got to get the shaky seats, right? You got to get the shaky <laughs> seats at home. That's, that's how you make a room. Term. We're no longer calling them tactile transfer. Shaky seats, baby. They're shaky seats. <laughs> shaky seats. <laughs> Did Michael. you get none of the rest of you guys saw Dune 2 yet? <laughs> I didn't. I will. Did you see it? And at Dolby Cinema. I no, did. I, will I saw wait, it this week. Wait, wait until second. it comes out in, on Casegate. So what I do you thought with that? Luke? I, I liked the first one. I'm not as much of a fan as some of these guys are. I mean, there's some diehard fans on this. I thought the first one was like a B plus range. That was for me. Okay. And I thought this one was a B minus. I thought okay. it was a small step down, but I still really enjoyed it. The so sound was phenomenal, just like the first mm -hmm. one. Um, the story got a little bit. I, I, it was a little long. It was a little bit too long for me. And mm -hmm. and some of the fight scenes and stuff, you, you they're constantly talking about how this group of warriors is amazing and unbeatable and stuff. And and all the fights were very one sided, very lopsided. Like uh, you never really saw any like intense combat that went back and forth. It was always just one way sweeps. Right. I, I had I had some complaints. I'm not probably going to go into that because it sounds like I'm against the grain here. But um, uh, maybe a little bit more critical with it than some people i still good movie b minus for me it's definitely worth watching the, just for the sound and audio alone yeah, no I mean, it's just amazing yeah for that <laughs> shaky whoopee <laughs> that's that fomo <laughs> shaky whoopee. i love it dude yeah hater eight said he watched it super cool a lot of guys i heard a lot of guys uh watch them they said they really enjoyed the movie mm -hmm. so i'm curious to see it myself Michael, appreciate the $2 super chat. Are TVs calibrated at Best Buy? What do you think? Probably not. They're just on, they have a, <laughs> we call it torture mode or not torture. Yeah. What do you call it? Torch, torch mode. mode. Vivid so mode. There's a setting. A lot of times when you first buy your TV, they kind of ask you, like, hey, is this in a commercial setting, like a Best Buy, or is this in a home use? Because well, those are relatively two and, new, but yeah. With that? That's a relatively new setting, but yeah. Yeah, so those are two entirely different like color modes. Um, they realize that if they're in the fluorescent lighting, that's going to be totally different environment. So they've got to kind of tweak that TV just to make it look good under those lighting conditions. And so more than likely, they're not calibrating anything because sometimes they'll sell a floor model, grab another TV when it comes in, put it right back on the shelf because they've just got to they've got to have those displays up. They're not calibrating those, I wouldn't think. Um, <clears throat> Getty appreciated the two large super chat. Is there ever a risk of calibrating a TV? Can that damage? Does it shorten the lifespan? Any negatives to doing a you know calibration on a TV that you can think of? I mean, nope. I would that actually I think of. I would actually think, I think it would that, help. So one thing I find that's interesting about calibrating a TV, typically when you count and correct me if I'm wrong because I don't have calibration software myself, but if you calibrate a projector, isn't it really difficult to go back, other than just a factory default, to go back to uncalibrated? Is it easier to do that with a TV? So um, you're probably talking about like how JVC, when you do the calibration with the, uh, with the automated version, that it overwrites the original calibration, you can't go back to it. Is that what yeah. you're referring to? Yeah. That's not the case with all of them. Uh, that's okay. like a JVC property. I, I don't think Sony and Epson do okay. that. I see. Okay. Like I said, I'm something curious. I was curious about myself. So D Nice says before you move mm -hmm. on that the home retail mode has been around since the early 2000s. What I specifically meant is that it asks you, a lot of the new TVs ask you mm -hmm. when you're right. going through the startup mode. Like it's a question that it asks you, is this in 
do you want this to be set to retail or whatever? And I, that's mainly as far as I understand it, because I don't work in retail anymore. The TV yeah. will automatically reset settings. Um, TVs so didn't used to do that. Steph, I appreciate the two large super chat. He says, if space is limited, can I put my surrounds, which are typically placed behind us, can we put those in front of us? My recommendation would be no. Um, it's going to get really wonky. I would rather have no surrounds. I, I guess it, it doesn't add any benefit to you to have your rear surrounds in front of you. The purpose of them <laughs> is to give you an immersive experience. But specifically, he didn't say rear surrounds. He just <laughs> What else would there be? Like sound bars? Wait, don't sound bars have surround in front? <laughs> they, do, they do, and that's why I question that. I don't think that's that's ideal. Um, yeah. So to me, one thing I've always tried to share with my audience is a properly set. Let, let's just say a properly set up five point one system. So you got five bed layer speakers, one subwoofer, is better than an improper set up like 7.1 or 9.1 um ideally you want to put them where they're supposed to be and most of that's determined by angles not by a certain distance so anytime that you deviate from that you're just going to get some really odd results i think so all right i'm gonna let you guys read some of this just to give my voice a rest lance alex says yes definitely reviewing post calibrated tvs is very secondary to what the majority even if the hardcore guy hardcore guys soft user configuration certainly needs to be included though so i think he's talking about like the settings and things like that with configuring the out of the box tv and fomo i think you're going to do that yeah allow people to change things and then mm -hmm. reset it back to fa factory yep yep and then yeah. show them how to get it close to the reference calibrated reference monitor close but then we get to a certain point where okay this is as close as it gets if you need it to get closer on this tv you're going to have to get it calibrated and it's it's also panel variance right some tvs come out of the sure. box a touch more accurate than others and they'll get to experience all of that and hopefully this time we don't have a tv that fails like last year was it the yeah, samsung right. s90c just died on us so yeah it happens it was embarrassed yeah <laughs> It's like, oh, no. Not really. I think that TV actually does really well with calibration. Yeah. It does. I think we talked oh, about this earlier. Spot Grady. on. Um, you know, what consumer calibrates their TVs. We did a poll, and this is not a, you know, a huge. This isn't an objective poll at all. Yeah. I mean, I just asked in the chat, and, and there were like two that, that chose to do their TVs. Ryan has some that he's calibrated. I think FOMO calibrates all his TVs. No, none of mine are calibrated. Oh, I'm sorry. So it really just depends on the consumer, you know, if they want to get that nth degree, if they want their TV to look the very best that they, that they can, then they're going to be the ones that choose that. Of course, with anything, it's, you know, in life, there's a, there's a price for performance typically. And some people aren't going to be willing to spend that price to get the additional performance. Some people say, man, absolutely worth it. So I think that's really just going to, you know, be determined by uh, the consumer. So Patrick, appreciate the $5 super chat. He says the closest Dolby cinema to me has gray blacks because of too much ambient light, man, that's unfortunate. Do the Dolby cinemas that you go to have the same problem? Kind of the exit lights, Ryan, I saw you shaking your head. No, but those exit lights are brutal. They are yeah, right. They yeah. always light up one corner of it. A Didn't bit. used to be a problem, but they are now. Yeah. Damn safety. <laughs> and then they also went to blue in the Dolby Cinema, and blue shows up on the screen a little bit more. That's why I like mm -hmm. the red lights because mm -hmm. uh, the old AMC Prime, before they rebranded the Dolby Cinema, used red, and you didn't. It didn't show up on the screen nearly as bad. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's why I refuse to see movies in the theaters now. Aubrey says, trying to buy an 85 inch stuck between the U8K. X90L and the QN90C, any advice would be appreciated. All right, my kind of question. So the Sony X90L, if you're experienced with Sony, it has the traditional Sony colors, even though it doesn't have a mini LED, it actually is almost as bright as the U8K. I would choose the X90L over the U8K because out of the box, it's gonna be closer to accurate than the U8K. The QN90C, on the other hand, is a better gaming TV than either of them because in game mode, it preserves its color saturation a little bit better. And it's just, you know, lower latency. 
X90L is not designed for gaming the same way the Q90C is. So if you have Xbox Series X, PlayStation 5, uh, the Q90C will look a little bit better. All three are great. The U8K will have the most kind of HDR impact to a certain degree, but if I was to rank them in order of premium and all the features, I'd go Samsung, Q90C, then X90L, then U8K. So get the one that's the cheapest if you're on a budget, because all three are excellent, by the way. But for visual quality, I think the Q90C is a step above the other two, and then comes the X90L. The U8K will give you the best HDR impact, but you're going to have... Are you sensitive to motion? Its motion is not as good as the Sony or the Samsung. And now, when you say impact, do you is that in any way it's, accurate? It, impact means that its specular highlights is actually going to be a little bit brighter than the Sony or the Samsung. Mm -hmm. um, if you compare it, same scene, it shows the let's say it's supposed to be two thousand nits, right? Because they're all kind of mini LED type TVs, except for the Sony. It'll have the brightest. It'll come closest to that 2000 nit specular highlight in there too, but its color accuracy will fall short, shorter than the other two. Is that the trade off you want? And most people don't care. They're going to be, it's all oh, phenomenal. But then do you want Google TV? So UAK has Google TV. Sony has a, to me, slightly better version of Google TV because they have more settings for you to play with. And I prefer the Samsung Tizen personally because I like the way they set everything up. It's, it's cleaner. It's easier to navigate. So that's another thing is the quality of life uh, between the TVs. But yeah, use case as well. If you're if you're watching a lot of cable, uh, low mm -hmm. bitrate content, the Sony should clean it up better. The XR Clear is on the X90C. Q90C also has a better image processor than the Hisense. If you have high quality bandwidth, you know you're always on a good gigabit connection. The U8K should be fine for streaming. So, is there another TV that you would pick over those? In that I would price range? I would pick the QM8 over the U8K if you want that matte, because the QM8 has better contrast, deeper blacks, slightly better blooming control. So I'd go with the QM8 and the X90L and the Q90C. The U8K has slightly better color accuracy though. So the QM8 is even worse. <laughs> and that's the thing is, this is the subjective part. How sensitive is Aubrey to skin tones? The Sony and the Samsung are the safe way to go because Samsung in filmmaker mode is actually pretty good. So the skin tones looks very natural. Sony mm -hmm. in its custom mode also looks good. TCL and Hisense, luck of the draw. You might get a good panel out of the box. I'm assuming she's not going to calibrate it. Sony is the safe way to go. It's normally my recommendation for most consumers. They'll be happy. And what TV is she coming from? If she's coming from a five-year-old TV, six-year-old Vizio, get the Sony. It'll look amazing compared to what she has before. If she's coming from a Samsung, they get the Samsung because the Sony may not have that exaggerated saturation mode that Samsung could have in its dynamic or standard mode. So what TV she's coming from is also important because if this is the UAK is the cheapest TV here and she wants to save money, she should get the UAK because it's still better than her six-year-old LCD TV. So it's relative to where you're coming from. And she might get a larger, oh, 85 inch, that's probably as large as she wants. But, and also keep in mind the 85 inch size, you're gonna have dirty screen effect, more commonplace on the high sense than the other two, just because Hisense and TCL are the larger sizes, that tends to happen, but she may not notice it. So, you know, it's it's one of the, the when you save money, they're cutting costs somewhere, but consistently, most of my viewers love the QN90C at the 85 inch size. So statistically, you will like the QN90C. I mean, that's just a very good TV. Next, good answer. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have Dolby Vision, doesn't matter. Because I know that's always, wait, it doesn't have Dolby Vision. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So, Stefan, appreciate the two large super chat. It says, removing surrounds, delete the sounds, delete it. I guess, like, basically when you, I'm trying to see how to rephrase what he's saying. Removing the surrounds, delete sounds, or convert to front. So he's asking, so if you do not have the surround, yes, they're going to be remapped to whatever speakers you've got. So it's going to push them to your front speakers anyway. It's it's not ideal, um, but I don't think you're going to be missing that. Am I correct in that, guys? So if you only had, let's say, a, instead of a, a 5.1 setup, so his question earlier was if he had his rear surrounds up front, so now you got five speakers up front as a front sound stage, LCR plus two surrounds, would that be basically the same as 
only having three speakers up front telling your AVR, you only have three speakers and then internally it's going to route whatever channel or whatever sound was supposed to be back there routed to your fronts. I don't know. With objects, it wouldn't route to the fronts, but with the press tracks, I think it folds it all into the channels you have. So your traditional Dolby digital, it'll fold it all down. But if you're using Dolby Atmos and there's an object that's supposed to be going on in the back, it, sure. it won't play. It doesn't fold that down. Okay. Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't had a 3.1 system in a long, long time, so I'm not real sure what that would do. And I've never tested it. Uh, SRW 1000, day one uncalibrated, day two calibrated. Going back to the TVs at M-Wave. Teach their own. Again, that's... It's still who's uh, who's doing the calibration. Great suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> now, and and to all fairness, let's say we have fifteen TVs there. Mm -hmm. So M Wave ends at let's say six o'clock at night. Show shuts down. Starts the next day at nine a.m. When do those TVs get calibrated? You know, so that 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 would be a huge challenge there. It would be cool ideally, but you'd almost have to have two sets of TVs. One calibrated, one uncalibrated. Um, it just, I think it'd be just a pretty logistical nightmare there. Christian, oh, I last thought he year, was talking about his own TV. Like he bought it and then the next day he calibrated it. No, I think he was saying, I think he was saying at M Wave, because that was during that whole discussion. So these are old, old questions um, from earlier on, on the show. Christian, last year the QN90A looked significantly better when Brian took it out of its calibration mode. Oh, yeah. Let me give it context. So that was the 98 inch, Ryan, remember that giant TV? Yeah. So the QN90 was a 98 inch and it did look a little, it, it looked like it was too dim. Okay. Whatever the mode it was in, which was, I think, Filmmaker. And Brian's like, look, if it looks too dim, you got to put it in standard, pop up the contrast enhancer. So he took it out of that dim look. And that was calibrated by Jason. And so two reasons for that is one, it's an older technology and it, it just was that first generation. It didn't have the contrast and the impact of the QM8 or the OLEDs, mm -hmm. obviously. So to keep up, we had to take it and put it into standard mode and then add in that contrast enhancer. And suddenly it was a completely different TV. And most people are like, oh, you know what? I would want to put it in this mode because that last mode, although accurate, that was calibrated, it, it just it did not have the pop, that three-dimensional pop we talk about. And but it was definitely the colors were oversaturated. Um, you know how contrasty the blacks were too black, right? A little mid-tones disappeared, but it looked more like that OLED experience that people saw mm -hmm. on the OLED, and they wanted that. And that's kind of like that extreme, that's why contrast enhancer is there, is to get you to that especially the lights on it was even worse that it was even more washed out so that helped a lot so that's what i think christian was referring to is when we put it in that standard slash dynamic mode you have that extra turbo and that's what they wanted to see cool rides home theater good to see you brother um appreciate the final super chat fomo in your opinion what 75 to 85 inch tv controls motion blur the best most of my content that i consume is tv uh, like sports sports honestly that would be definitely either the samsung or the lg the sony sports motion they're designed for movie motion their controls for sports motion the number one complaint is oh i see some artifacts blah 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 that's not going to happen in the samsung or the lg i think they it's almost as if they definitely optimized their their sports mode and motion optimized mm -hmm. for sports better than sony so you're pretty safe with either samsung or lg you hype up the the anti-jitter max right max interpolation you're going to have great motion resolution is how i would describe it mm -hmm. and probably samsung this year has upped their game a little bit more they're very focused on sports motion this year cool appreciate the question don and the super chat um going back here chris says good evening gentlemen is there a certain tv brand that comes better calibrated out of the box i feel my lg c2 needs some calibration does he have fomo is he just feel, uh, like a uh, filmmaker mode on all the tvs come closest but they all have their out of the box color 
issues that need to be fixed on the LG. It's a slight green push. So if you see gray scenes, there's always that. I don't know. I mean, they know about it. I don't know why it's still there. It's like a slight green. On the Sony QD OLEDs, there's a slight magenta and red that you're going to have to take down. Those are the two things that I see as most commonly addressed on your C2 probably does need calibration. Uh, look at, if you have spirits and muscle, look at the faces of the female models. Mm -hmm. If they look a little bit green or pale to you, especially the, I guess there's a, a Latina there and maybe an Asian. The Asian one is really good because if she's even slightly pale, you could tell when there's too much mm -hmm. green. And the C2 is no exception. Uh, so you probably do. <laughs> if you watch a lot of skin tones, that's that's where I notice it. I would say that every TV benefits from calibration. I mean, it's no TV is perfectly calibrated out of the box. I mean, I can't say no. Maybe there is one just by happenstance, but um, I think virtually any situation you're going to benefit because the calibration is mainly benefiting, in my opinion, the viewing environment, right? Because the viewing environment is going to impact how things are represented or how you're mm -hmm. perceiving them on the display. So. Yeah, you could absolutely benefit from calibration. Now, what brand would you say out of the box is closest? Sony is the most pleasant out of the box because it's always the air on the side of warmth. And for whatever reason, LG is airing on the side of green. And mm -hmm. maybe it's changing this year. I don't know. It's just the last few years I've noticed that. So, and TCL is airing on the side of magenta. Really weird. And mm -hmm. Hisense is very similar to Sony. It's, it's airing on the side of warmth. So out of the box, if you don't notice the TV is too warm, then you're okay. And when you get a Sony, it's that's what I've noticed is, you know, warmth is appealing. It's not, you're not going to notice it. And you always have that on the Samsung, warm one, warm two, right? You can play with that. But mm -hmm. it feels to me that Sony consistently, and we're talking, I'm not saying accuracy, it has the most appeal out of the box. That's why people sure. stick with Sony. So D Nice says, if you're at a white point target of D65, LG comes closest. That's a good point. And D Nice, by the way, he calibrates. He's hundreds. a professional calibrator. I mean, he sees more C2s and G2s, C3s and G3s than probably anyone. I mean, he's calibrated so many. So he has a pulse on statistically what you're going to see from these mm -hmm. from these TVs. Yeah. So that makes sense. Cool. Now, Dwayne, is that consistent through all of the LG OLEDs or is that only for a specific model? And what mode is that in? I'd be interested to know. I'm assuming it's Filmmaker, but probably I don't know. So I'm not real sure what this is. Boss says, in my opinion, misleading. 99% of TV. regarding the title. The title. The title. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. Watch gotcha. JD says... Uh, they should review based on most accurate out of the box made and fully calibrated. They should be equally weighed in terms of final recommendation. I think we've, we've kind of addressed a lot of that during that first hour and a half. Yep. So if you're watching the replay or, I mean, if you've kind of joined us late, go back and watch the beginning. It's worth it. <clears throat> it was fun conversation for sure. Robert showing a calibrated TV and uncalibrated on uh, shows the consumer, the reason for it being, yeah. So I think we hit that as well, right? And just to go back to what Dwayne said, he says all LGs in Filmmaker and ISF modes. Is that, I'm going to ask another question. Is that just LG OLEDs or does that include LED Q LCD Neds. as well and QNEDs and all that stuff? Oh, he, he clarified all LG OLEDs. That, that makes sense. Okay. That's their Halo product. They take yeah. that seriously. Man, I think a lot of our car, our starred comments from earlier were, I think we, we kind of addressed a lot of them. So. But I'll, I'll, I haven't read through them, so I'm just going to put them up there. And if we've addressed it, we'll just move on. The calibration should be irrelevant in ratings. The information should be given, but it should not have any effect on the recommendations, regardless mm. of price tag segment. What are your thoughts on that? I, I don't agree with that. Yeah, I. that's the other extreme. As a formal TV review, I don't agree with that either because it's hard to render – an apples to apples opinion at that point. Mm -hmm. So M Wave. So you know we have to separate this. So it's like, wait, is FOMO switching? We're talking about as a buyer consumer, right? Guiding them at M Wave. But when I'm doing a comparison for reviews, all of my TVs are calibrated because I, I need them to match a specific standard. Once they're matched, now I compare their ceiling 
capabilities, which is what a lot of people want to know, mm -hmm. is what's the ceiling capability of these TVs? And then when they ask me specifically, well, this is my use case, what should I get? Then I will fall back on a response that doesn't require it to be calibrated. So it's so, and you guys know this, right? It's so use case specific yeah. that it's it's hard to give a one size fit all review. You, mm -hmm. can, you can do what you can with the review for review purposes, but like what he's saying, calibration should be irrelevant in ratings. I don't rate my TVs. I, I can't because everything is a use case. So maybe he's talking about the ratings ratings.com no. which they do score right, right and sure. and they score it you know they have their uncalibrated mode their calibrated their calibrated scores so uh, but i disagree generally speaking as a as, as a principal as a reviewer i need to have it calibrated too okay. i think yeah. it should be two separate yeah. things right you should have a recommendation yeah. for uncalibrated and a recommendation for calibrated because Lumping them both together or just making one irrelevant leaves too much out of that equation. There's too many variables left unaccounted for. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate the follow super chat. Uh, cheap, extra large TVs intrusion into the projector market. What's the future of projectors and short throw? Are they here to stay or <clears throat> their future is uncertain? And so I actually have a dedicated video on this. We talked about it on our. <laughs> Our podcast because i think it is a very relevant conversation and it's funny because i've got a screenshot there's about six other or seven other content creators they've got a video as well so there's plenty of us with our opinions on this my personal opinions extra large tvs are not going to be replacing dedicated home theater projectors anytime soon um, there's a lot of challenges with that where do you place the center channel um the heat the cost all of that stuff um where I do think that they could really impact is the ultra short throw projectors because the purpose of the ultra short throw projectors initially was they were being marketed as large TVs. Well, now we have large TVs, 98 inch, 100 inch, 115s coming around the corner um, and they're going to become more affordable. So once those happen, I'm not so certain that ultra short throw projectors are really needed. Um, so that's my own personal take but like i said I've, I've seen a bunch of content creators they provided their own thoughts on that but i think it's a great discussion for sure getty because that's where we're at we've got these large format tvs which is amazing it's great i just don't see that it's going to be you know um replacing now jonathan we had a good discussion on that jonathan's like i don't know michael if they came out with a blank size uh, i think 120 this. oled man i'm out I'm I'm leaving the projector world. I'll figure out the center channel. I, I think I've got to agree with Jonathan because the majority of projector <laughs> installs that I do, mm -hmm. they're around that 110 to 120 inch range. And most people do not put speakers behind the projector, even if it's yeah. the standard throw. And again, that, that's not, not for everybody, but I just don't see that. But I think you're looking at it from the enthusiast market, the people that are doing the I bigger could. stuff. And that's I the could. minority, I think. Yeah, 100%. So, I think it's yeah, coming. The majority of my my audience doesn't even have a dedicated home theater. Yeah, I At think it's. Don't. I think it's coming. Now, for people that are audio purists, I don't mm -hmm. know that it ever will. But I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I I think it's going to displace the five thousand dollar ultra yeah. short throws. I mean, oh. so <laughs> let's not talk about the. You know the premium JVCs above ten thousand. I think that's a, a different world. But yeah. when you have a one hundred inch, that's two thousand dollars. It's displacing an entire segment of the mm -hmm. five thousand dollar ultra short throw crowd, right? Yeah. The high sense that yeah. was five thousand with a screen, right. and, and I think one hundred and one ten inch are so close to one fifteen one twenty. A lot of people in the two thousand dollar range will be like, you know, I don't have to deal with a screen or whatever. So. Uh, below 5,000, anything that was selling is going to be gone in the next mm -hmm. few years because already brand new launch U76 high sense $2,000. I couldn't believe and it sold out at Best Buy. You guys yeah. saw that within two weeks. It's oh, gone. Phenomenal. So those were potential ultra short throw buyers, right? Uh, they lost all those guys. You got to think the ultra short throw thing is strange because they're, they seem to be ramping that up 
but it's it i can't see it lasting either like it seems like it's yeah. gonna be a flash in the pan yeah and it's very strange that they're focusing their efforts on it right now at least as an industry it seems like we are getting more models more advancements more like it seems to be like the end thing at abs forum and it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense with these big tvs right well, at isc i mean there were big tvs everywhere mm -hmm. even in 21 by 9 aspect ratios it was oh really that's yeah. interesting tcl had some um, What's kind of interesting too is I've heard some um, interviews with, let's say, a certain brand, and they manufacture both. They manufacture a large TV, but they also manufacture LC or I mean, uh, ultra short throw projectors. That is true. And, and their comment was, "We think that there's enough use case scenario for each." So, at least from what they're saying outwardly, they think there is room for both. I'm just not certain of that. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. I don't, maybe in America it's different. The U.S. is different <clears throat> than other countries too. Maybe in Asia, they just want to throw it on a wall. They don't want a giant TV. Uh, it's easier to carry an ultra short. Personally, I hate the ultra short throw for you got to balance it perfectly. I mean, auto mm -hmm. keystone, but you don't have auto balance. I mean, you know, you don't have it perfect. Kid walks by, dog walks by, knocks yeah, into an ultra short throw. It. It's another hour out of your life. <laughs> but but follow, I hate that. you have these little... <laughs> kind of puck that go around the feet to keep it from moving. Yeah, the fact that it takes an hour just to get it up and running, it's, right? It's a pain. It That's the big like, town. I have the, the, the high sense PX2 Pro here. It took me almost an, definitely an hour to get everything set right. And, and I, I have it on top time, of time. You have to yeah, skew it too. Every single like time. You, it, it doesn't make so, like, I'm warping the image intentionally, and it just kind of, it kind of breaks my heart. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to warp it. I don't want to bend the corners to make it fit in the screen. So it's, right. it's and not to mention you know, and the screen itself, right? It's easier mm -hmm. to throw it on a wall. If your screen is like, wait, is it, is my screen off? What? So, and then you have to roll it up, roll it back down. Like, oh, right. and, and you For get, sure. forget all of that, right? All of that you don't have to worry about. And I think once a person has gone through the nightmare of their first ultra short throw, and they see a, <laughs> that's it. I'm done. I see a one fifteen. One, one time purchase. Huh? That's it. <laughs> yeah. It's a challenge. Jr. Question. Um, so, should a well calibrated TV look good in any room environment, or is the calibration specific for each room environment? Because we know some rooms have more light control. Some rooms are like my living room has three massive, um, like a sliding glass door. There's other windows that. Kind of impede into the room so is the calibration based on the lighting condition and even a question from me tagging in with this are you able to calibrate for let's say lights on and lights off i'm guessing not but so what's the what's the thought on there the well the calibrators i've spoken to it has to be specific for if the tv is in a room where the lights are on and you have pink walls that affects how you see the light coming out of your TV because your eyes are adjusting for your wall. Is your wall white? Is your wall that 15% gray color that you bought specifically to keep it from shifting in your own eyes? So that's why they say it, your TV is assumed that you're in a completely black room, dark room, and then you have that special ambient lighting that doesn't affect the color. But that is the ideal situation. But if your room is lit, the calibrator has to make a they have to offset the sure. room yeah. so if you have a hot pink room the calibrator is going to have to take that into consideration okay and i guess at that point he just has to say hey what is the typical viewing environment like when you're watching movies or watching tv is it with the lights all yeah. on yep. which probably a lot of people it is and, yeah. and what kind of light is it warm lights tungsten mm -hmm. you know you have yeah. people with these old Old, what is it old timey tungsten super yellow red lights that's lighting up the room sure. uh, that uh, that affects how they calibrate your tv as well yep i agree uh, let's see dennis i wasn't aware of tvs being calibrated prior to reviews i feel a bit naive now so <laughs> that's, the, the, that's our 80 percent right there right yeah uh boss says if the reviews are for consumers then they should be reviewed how most are going to use the tv so that's that's fair so his opinion is out of the box would be uh, better. Getty says, is calibrating a TV? Okay, we talked about that one. Does it, you know, reduce the lifespan? Miles said, I put 100 hours on my C1 before I calibrated. It was night and day difference to him. 
So some of these aren't questions, but they're just thoughts. Uh, Christopher, if I'm spending over three thousand dollars on a TV, it's worth the calibration and wall mount. See, so he finds the value in that. And that's going to, I think that's going to vary from person to person. Some people are going to spend $4,000 on TV, but they still don't want to calibrate. Some may spend 2000 and want to calibrate. It just depends on the individual. I'm trying to see how the wall mount works in that one. <laughs> Get a free <laughs> wall mount can't. with every calibration. Well, or? If you're super cheap and you don't want to mess with it, you just put the little feet on. <laughs> but then like, okay, if I'm going to spend three grand, I want this thing to float on the wall. I'm going to cut a hole in the wall drop the power cord and the HDMI. Like, I'm going to spend some money. But if I'm just throwing, if I got 700 bucks, man, we're going TV stand or I mean feet. We're dropping the cord right behind there and call it a day. I think is what he was saying. Uh, Chad says reviews using calibrated TVs and filmmaker mode really don't offer much. I personally want to know about what all the TV can do and it's various modes and options. And again, that is, you know, that's what's important to chat. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that that's a representation of every consumer out there for sure. Um, but if that's important to you, then, you know, and that's the hard thing. Some people, anytime that we do a comparison, even if I compare like on my channel, I'll do a lot of audio. I don't do a lot of video. So I may be comparing two subwoofers. Well, there's a bunch of different ways that you can compare them. There's a bunch of ways that you can measure them. You know, do you do near field? Do you do at the main listening position? Um, there's so many different ways. And the reality is content creators and reviewers, we physically can't do every single scenario out there. We just have to do the best that we can. And and uh, so I'm, I'm sure, you know, FOMO, he's got his style and his way of calibrate or, I mean, reviewing TVs and comparing them. But then you may have another person that does TV reviews, Brian or whoever. And they may do it slightly different. And that's a good thing to me because now you're getting kind of a broader spectrum of, you know, the different ways that you can look at those comparisons. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, and you definitely you want to follow reviewers who watch the kind of movies you watch, right? Because if all the content is I Love Lucy and Columbo, mm. and you're like, wait. Well, I, you know, I watch Pacific Rim, you know, you, and you list all these action, bright Disney Plus, and he never mentions any of Jonathan's those. favorite movies, mm -mm. <laughs> the, the Walt, the Waltons. <laughs> so, uh, it, it reflects the reviewers' preferences and tastes, and they're getting TVs based on those things they watch. So, if you watch enough mm. of a reviewers' reviews and the content they use. You get an idea of which reviewers reflect your taste as well. And and that's why I like live streams. That's when you show up to say, hey, you didn't mention this, but you know, I watch it this, 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 this is my room. What are your thoughts now? And it might be a completely different answer that was never mentioned in the review. And that's why I think live streams are so important. It gives a chance for everyone to come by and ask, well, you never mentioned this. What do you think of this? And sometimes I say, I have no idea. I don't have this, you know, I don't have Paramount. I don't know how Paramount's gonna look, I'm sorry. Um, Herc calibrated screens have more depth to me, like you're looking into the picture as opposed to at it. Could that be subjective? I mean, I don't know. how you I mean, feel about what you're looking at is going to be subjective. Yeah. So, and that's great. At least and in some context. Yeah. And, and again, you know, if calibration works for you and you've got the budget for it, then absolutely go for it, man. You're going to get the best performance out of your display possible. Aaron says, it's the FOMO, period. <laughs> what if it's better calibrated? What if I'm missing out? I've had them calibrated and had them not for what I and probably 99 point whatever percent of us do out of the box is, is ideal and perfect for him. Classy, never had a proper calibration with reference equipment, asked to be changed or not liked. Some calibrators don't do it correctly or have reference equipment. Classy tech calibrations, I got news for you, man. I don't know you, you don't know me, but I know plenty of people who said to me that they've had a calibrator come in and they didn't want to hurt their feelings or do anything else and they just reverted after they left. So they're not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm not going to tell somebody who I just paid money that I don't like the calibration, but I'm going to switch it back afterwards if I don't like Some it. Some people do. Well, sure. 
in the projector right. world, the biggest thing that we hear is, man, after calibration, I lost brightness. Yeah. And I actually like the brightness. I want that back. And so it's more accurate, but it's not what some people prefer. So, but yeah, I've heard, I've heard it both ways for sure. Iceman, listen to what Classy Tech is saying, y'all. Okay. Siphonics Audio, good to see you. Are there any user-friendly consumer-level calibration kits? So I was thinking about the Apple TV. You can use your iPhone mm. with it to calibrate it, but I have, you can't do it with projectors, so I haven't tried it. Does it not work good? I don't know. I have I would want... We should test that, actually. Mm. We should. That, that would be a cool thing for MWA. That would be good. Yeah. That'd be a cool experience at M-Wave. We should see how accurate that is. One is calibrated with the, your uh, super fancy thousands of dollars Ooh. calibrator, and one is calibrated with Apple TV. Same exact TV. Which one is which? Oh. There you go. That'd be interesting, Ryan. I can't, Yeah. I need. We need to do that beforehand. <laughs> do a dry run? Or a dry, run? Well, I want to see if it's worth it. I mean, if it's not mm -hmm. worth it, then... I mean, I could do it on my two C2s mm -hmm. or C3s at home just to... Interesting. See. Yeah. Interesting. So going back to his point, consumer friendly video calibration kits, what are we talking about? And maybe what are the pros and cons of that? Because I know that um, Nick came down and he used a Spider X to calibrate my previous NZ7 from JVC. I'm sorry, NX7 from JVC. And um, a lot of people said, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good for, a, is it luminance? but it's not good for color or maybe the opposite, something like that. They basically said, they, they say, yeah, it's decent for this. Cause it's only a couple hundred bucks. Um, but if you really want it to look good, you're going to have to use something higher than that or this other part of it. But I don't, again, I'm not a TV caliber. Correct. There's, it depends on the display. I mean, for TVs, spider X, I think is okay for getting into laser. The cat, the professional calibrators are going to need to weigh in on. And I'm not sure why and why um, not. I'm not the correct one to answer referring that question. To TVs or projectors, um, and one may do better for one than the, than the other. Yeah, see, like uh, Don Horizon Home Theater says, Spider X for JVC. Um, but again, it's got some limitations. So I mean, if you want a good calibration, you're probably going to spend some good money on that. Unfortunately. Be nice. This conversation would be nice to have home have with calibrators. Lots of okay. We already hit that one. Lots we already hit that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that verbally. Grave danger. When we'll be able to calibrate just using our smartphone cameras? Kind of already can. Kind of sort of. Yeah. Doesn't do it well, but Samsung <laughs> has their app, and TCL had it. Yeah. The the problem is the sensitivity of your camera sensor. I mean, we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Your camera taking a picture of the TV compared yeah. to what your Jetty twelve thousand dollar ten thousand dollar special sensor device that you put against right. the TV to measure to the upteenth percent. So your yeah. camera might get you to a certain level for D sixty five, which is all it's trying to do. They're not making any other adjustment. They're just hoping to get you close to D sixty five. But a calibrator does so much more individual color and so the cameras are not designed for that you can't put your camera up to a tv in that way so well and they the uh, camera may do okay on a tv but and by okay i mean i don't know because i've never done it <laughs> uh, but when you get into a laser projector i you're not going to have the granularity um to be able to do what you need to with the light like d nice just said you really need at least 4.5 nanometer spectro to profile a calor a calorimeter for your jvc so those are the kinds of features that you're getting with the higher end gear mm -hmm. that you fall short with on the more entry-level consumer stuff yeah but okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna we we need to do this because i'm curious right we I'm were talking earlier too. like a de Somebody mentioned in the comments, hey, my TV had a DE of 2.5. I got it calibrated now as a DE of 1.5. So that made a little improvement. <laughs> but that's not going to be noticeable, according to FOMO, because he said you had to be like the RT insight yeah. said you got to be about three different to notice a difference. And, and then so, it's scene to scene specific, too, right? It's like mm. a, a, a correct green grass versus an incorrect green grass. You have to put a special face, a certain skin tone. And is it off because of green? Is it off because of blue? Is it, 
it's yeah and this is ratings position if it's under three percent don't worry about it that's that's kind of mm -hmm. like they're published but they try to get as accurate as possible but they say when it's between less than three percent most people will not notice the difference and that side by side you probably will how many people are going to have it side by side to a reference monitor as well so right. yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. that's and then no, extrapolate really. the question out how how close do these get what's the what's the de on a phone like an iphone camera is not a cheap junk it's quantity of scale and it's probably three four hundred dollar camera the color monkey people are using it a couple hundred dollars i don't know that this is going to be i don't know just logically i don't know that this is going to be a worse camera than a lesser quantity of scale, a lesser, smaller manufactured company that's doing a calibration piece of gear. Mm -hmm. So curiosity, I think it'd be neat to see. How it's much like, difference is there? Yeah, okay, maybe it's more accurate with the color with the with the real calibration gear, but maybe this is good enough. Maybe. I don't know. I've never done it. Yeah. Just curious. Don't know. And especially if we did that a blind comparison after Wouldn't we that did be it. fun. All right, Jonathan. Like, let's what do you like? Time. That'd be fun. Jonathan, you might not head that up at Emily. That'd be fun, dude. <laughs> Well, I think like, Jonathan and I should fun. test it first to see if it's yeah. even worthwhile. Yeah, so this is um, I'm a I'm actually skipping out of order just because I, I think it's a, a great thought here. Or question is, you know, what's the general ballpark? Um, are we talking like say, because I know I've heard five hundred dollars. I know some of them calibrate fifteen hundred dollars or three thousand because they're professionals. They've been doing this forever. They fly out to your home and they'll calibrate. There you go. If you're in Alaska. Probably three thousand dollars. You got to fly out there. You're the only one they're calibrating. You got to put them up in a hotel. <laughs> but general ballpark, if somebody wanted to hire one of these guys, uh, Southern you know, California, probably between five and six fifty. Okay. Just take inflation. I, I don't want to beat these guys up. Yeah, yeah, Starts sure. at five fifty. Okay. I, I'd say today, and but this is compared to when I got it for twenty five bucks at Best Buy. And now hmm. I know it's only SDR, but the fact yeah. that they did it for $25, that's why they stopped doing it, right? I'd call yeah. them over and they do like six TVs. I paid Best Buy like <laughs> under $200. And he was there all day. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> but you know, he didn't care. He was on the clock, right? And then like right. eight months later, they canceled the whole thing. I think I, think I single-handedly pushed all the <laughs> calibration services to their limit because I kept on calling them over <laughs> to calibrate right. my right. TVs. It was great. Yeah, Iceman said that the phone calibration don't do much. You can try it, but it, it really won't be worth it. Got a yeah, few but more that's here. being said by a calibrator, and all due respect, Iceman, I mean, you've been saying you're a calibrator in here, so I wouldn't expect to say anything other than that. I mean, just being honest. <laughs> Shots fired! <laughs> uh, WKRP, or WKR Piper in Cincinnati. High sense. Homo, what's your opinion? It's a high sense, specifically the U8K 75 inch. Excellent TV. Uh, get it before they're sold out. The 85 inch is already sold out. So oh yeah, for the other person who's asking about it, it's probably not available if they're looking at Best Buy. And that's been sold out for over a month now. 75 inch, I, I recommend it. I think it's a great TV. Uh, I like Hisense today. The UAK, the U7 series, excellent TVs for the money. And I say for the money because obviously if you pay a little bit more, Sony X95L and so forth. But the UAK, is, it punches above its weight so the uak 75 inch is like what 1200 1300 for a 75 inch it justifies that price it's good a lot of value. i like it yeah. yeah and probably for the average consumer the non super yeah. enthusiast they're going to be very pleased with that image very pleased with it yeah yeah uh, let's see a couple more eddie picked up a ls 12000 from epson planning on a 160 inch 69 screen is it possible to mask only one part of the screen top or the bottom not both uh, sure. for 2.39 uh, 3, 2.39 to 1 scope uh sorry for going off topic no this is totally on topic we're good here Eddie. yeah that's totally possible you just you just raise the overall image to the top and then you would mask the bottom or lower it and, and mask the top you don't have to keep it right in the middle when you're when you're doing your over zoom and jonathan on the ls12000 i believe it has motorized zoom so yes. you can raise and lower the image so Correct. what jonathan was talking about you go in the menu and you just say okay i want to slide this up to the top and then you go into the masking section and you've got four-way masking left top right and bottom so then you would just mask the bottom off yeah the masking is kind of a pain in the butt in my opinion i mean people do what they do but if you got a dvd player or something that has like a little menu system at the bottom or you know mm -hmm. there's any kind of structure yeah, just it doesn't move it up it's yeah. masked out it's just not there yeah. So 
I personally don't end up using the masking for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of times when I was before I got the Mad VR Envy, I would <laughs> same thing what you're saying. When I would zoom out to my scope, the menu would be down like on my oh, yeah. my entertainment center basically, and I'd have to like, oh man. Okay, but you can it see it. I mean, it's yeah. it's cruddy to see, but you can see it, right? Otherwise, yeah. it's just not there. You don't even know. Right. You got nothing. Exactly. Uh, Jonathan says, what size do reference monitors come in? Great question. Could that size, if if not close to TV size, sway the choice? So the the mon reference monitor that we're talking about, possibly getting for M-Wave, what size is that? They're not very big. No, so we're talking inches. Like, 32, 32 inches and they are yeah. not cheap so a valid yeah. question is that going to is that you're not I, going okay. to own a reference monitor as a tv you no know, I, I think he, he's saying like would it sway i think he's saying if the size if not close to a tv what's the point <laughs> why would you buy a tv over a reference monitor is how i'm taking that question i guess i looked at it differently um It's like if I don't know if it's smaller, would it would it sway my decision of when I'm looking at a big hundred inch TV that's non calibrated next to a thirty two inch calibrated? Oh, is my perception of what I'm seeing not going to be? You're getting into psychology there. <laughs> I don't know. So that that was my thought. Carl says, what are your thoughts on running a 9.4.6 with separates plus other video gear only on 220 amp outlets? I'm aware of calculated watts down to 120 watts, but wanted to hear your opinion. Great question, Carl. So in my theater, I run a 7, technically 7.2.4. So I don't have a 9.4.6. I have one dedicated 20, and I've never had any issues at all. I would think, unless your speakers are just crazy and efficient, you've got massive 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 amplifiers i just have one big 11 channel amplifier from um monolith it's 11x um and one does fine i would think and i would hope that two 20 amps would be sufficient but then you got somebody like ryan that runs you know 30 50 amp circuits to his room and <laughs> you still want more juice and tico's calling going dude we ain't got enough power to send to your house bro like you're bankrupting us. All in a day's yeah. work. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that though? I mean, if he's running a, a, just a standard 9.4.6, he's got separate. So he's got some, you know, video gear. He's got some amplifiers for that. I've got everything in my room on 220 amps that are dedicated. Yeah. And that includes uh, four 6,000 iNuke amps. Mm -hmm. Um, and that includes a DSP 3000 amp, a Crown XLS 802 amp, and two Crown 8 300 amps. Mm -hmm. So split over two dedicated 20s. Point being, you're not going to have a trouble with that. And the reason you're not going to have trouble with that is most of the time your home theater is cruising on nothing, like just a couple, three, four watts in your normal listening. And it has those dynamic peaks that are much higher. Mm -hmm. But the dynamic peaks will pass through your breaker. Your breaker can pass three to four times its rated current temporarily That's so if you got a 20 amp breaker it can pass hmm. like 80 amps for a very short duration and that very short duration matches up with dynamic peaks in music so the only time you'll ever throw a breaker is if you are basically continually running it at like club volumes and allowing that dynamic to build up heat and you're probably you're probably using way more than the the amount on your breaker you're probably using way more than 20 amps but only in those peaks of the music and it takes a while for the wire to heat up and the breakers trip on heat. So realistically, you just you have to have some just crazy stuff to throw breakers and be playing sign sweeps, that kind of stuff at, at low volume dubstep type music. I can I the only time I've ever thrown a breaker in here was playing dubstep at like reference volume with the subs 15 dB hot. So, yeah. um, you know, the kind of stuff where you're breaking things is when you could possibly throw a breaker with a lot of subs. That's cool. when it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> that's when it gets exciting you start breaking a tile jonathan yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did throw a breaker there at that event too I bet. we had all the subs plugged into 120 amp at that one and it, and, it, and it finally did break she said i'm i'm i've reached my capacity i'm done last question of the night guys uh, 
brain guy says is there a universal remote available that is as powerful and yet easy to program as the harmony line was man that is the age old question um, we're all waiting on that day the only thing and i've mentioned this many times the only thing i see on the market currently that's consumer programmable i don't know how easy it is program because i haven't gotten one yet to review um, it used to be called the YIO Remote 2, and they've rebranded the name. So now it's called Unfolded Circle Remote 2. Um, they had like a Kickstarter program, and then they, they shipped them all to their um, the people that backed that project first. Um, but I haven't heard a lot of feedback. I've reached out to them several times. I just haven't, they haven't sent me one. So I have no idea if that's going to be a good solution. Um, the challenge for them, it's, it's literally two or three guys, four guys in the business. So they don't have the, the funds. They don't have the dev team that Harmony did. With Harmony, it was great because pretty much no matter what you bought, you just say, okay, I have this Morant Cinema 10. And it goes, okay, boop, there's all the codes for it. For that, uh, the Unfolded Circle Remote 2, probably a lot of those are going to be consumer how do i explain that the consumers are going to contribute to that database so as consumers plug in the codes and the ir codes it gets somehow maybe dumped into a database but they're not they said up front they're like we won't have the this massive repertoire repertoire repository i think is the word i'm trying to say they don't have the massive repository that um that Harmony had, you know, so I think, but it looks cool. I'll be honest, but it's also more expensive. It's like 450 bucks us dollars. So, so let's be talk, aware. don't be an early adopter on that. Unfortunately, well, and I want to talk about Harmony too. Do you guys re not remember how much Harmony sucked? I, I get frustrated. <laughs> with them, I'll be honest with you, but in all fairness, it's the best thing. Is it, it? Is the best that we had available? It's, it's the, it's the best it? among the worst. The because, among the worst. But the reason I'm saying that is because there really weren't very many options. You had URC, which is Again. still around. That was worse. Yeah. Like it's looking hard. back at Harmony, the remotes were awful. I mean, they're yeah. slow. They're I, unresponsive. Yeah, I agree. You know, people say they're easy to program. They are. They can be, but sometimes they, uh, the UI isn't in a lot of the programming parts isn't good. Their app was atrocious. So I don't think came, that at all. When it came to the Harmony Hub, no, I, dude, that, that app easy. is awful. No, I liked it. No, it made it it made it easy for me to because I can go in and I can change stuff. I can add. It, no, it's I'm not super, talking about that. I'm talking about the actual remote app. You never used it, did you? May okay, okay. <laughs> I'm talking about just like programming. No, I mean, even, yeah, okay. I mean that was okay, but the yeah. I think we have a lot of this. What's the word I'm looking for um, when something's old and we're thinking back on it? Nostalgia. nostalgia. Nostalgia, right? We have a lot of nostalgia about Harmony and thinking that, oh, it was so good. And I don't think it's, it really was. I have it now. And it's like the frustrating part for me, a couple things is, you know, I'll scroll on my remote and Harmony looks at me and goes, what do you want me to do? Oh, you want me to move and then it'll scroll. I mean, I'm but used by to that my, time I, you maybe hit it again and you now you're doing it's scrolling multiple it's doing times. an activity. Yeah, it's like yeah. So, yeah, it's not that great, but for the average consumer, it was just easy to program. Oh, yeah. But you know, sometimes you'll hit it's not like a control four where it yeah. works every well, time. Okay. But even then, so here's what I've come to realize as a custom integrator is that no matter what remote mm. is in the theater. That's, that's the first thing that's going to be out of somebody's mouth is my remote sucks. I mm. want a new one. It doesn't matter if it's Harmony, Control 4, Crestron, Savant, RTI, any of them. It's I hate it. Please fix it. You're going to hate whatever you put in here. So yeah. I think it's important for people to just try and put into context. And I, I don't think it's horrific, but... Mm -hmm. Just try and make sure that the bar is being properly set. Because if you think Harmony's up here and yeah, you haven't correct. used it for a while, maybe go back and see what it's like to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. <laughs> That's because fair. It's I don't think it's as good as people say it is. And 
some of those Harmony remotes were not cheap. I mean, they were like stupid expensive. When you're talking about what was the the elite? How much? Well, the elite's elite? what I have. It's two fifty, and and I think most of the time it was. I guess when it first came out, it was about two fifty, but I think it eventually got down to either two or one fifty somewhere. Did it? There. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't super crazy. I guess I'm misremembering. Yeah. No. But how um, long ago was that? I mean, the elite's been around a while, dude. Probably. Yeah. At l I would say ten years. So if we take into how everything else is ballooned in yeah, price, yeah, true. I mean, is a four hundred dollar remote really that yeah. out of the question yeah. when we're talking about two hundred fifty ten ten years yeah. ago? I don't know. Yeah, but there is no good option. They all suck. Yeah, and a lot of guys, you know, they're they're using CEC now to control, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that's a good option. There are some app programs. I forget the the brand, but. There's some that, that people use with their setup. Well, um, what we've been using with CEC specifically is if you got an iPhone mm -hmm. and an Apple TV, you just have the Apple TV turn on the TV and control it all on your phone. You got mm -hmm. volume control, you can control everything, and then you don't really have a remote. I'm waiting on Ava. I know it's not end user controllable, but I'm sure. interested to see how that all goes. I just want something that doesn't suck and I don't hate selling to people. I think we're all looking for that that product. So somebody out there's got to create it. One day. So some, are, some are trying to work on it. They're just not doing a great job at it. And so until then, or until we get, you know, one of those remotes in hand and we can play with it, test it, see how well it is and share that with you guys. We're all just kind of. I, I just deal with mind. a table full of remotes. I've, I've accepted my fate. You masochist. I don't do that. I can't do that. Yeah. So. Well, FOMO, it seriously, it's always a pleasure having you on, man. You, you provide Absolutely. a lot of wisdom. We're going to have a blast at M Wave this year. FOMO and Brian are going to be heading up the TV room. So they're going to be doing a bunch of different TVs. FOMO, we got some bigger TVs coming this year, I think, right? Yep. We're trying to get some 98 inch TVs from various brands. Uh, we, we don't know which they are yet. So I don't want to make any promises, but sure. for sure, we're right. going to have, we're going to try to get the latest 98 inch TVs so they can have an experience or 100, right? Mm -hmm. either one yeah because it's going to be exciting a lot of the tv brands are committed to affordable 98 and 100 inch tvs and that's the key word they're trying to keep yeah. everything under seven thousand dollars depending on the the brand which i think is very important okay so one thing um you guys can sign up for the m wave um newsletter so i'll post like when fomo gives me information eventually what i told fomo i'd love to have on the website once he do <laughs> i'm about to mess that up once he does know, you know, some more details, I want to create a dedicated page for that so that we can kind of, you know, let yeah. you know what you can expect in that room. Um, but we've got a lot of stuff, a lot of fun stuff that we've got planned for M-Wave. So we'd love for you guys to join us June 21st to the 23rd in Kansas City, Missouri. Jonathan, it's been a blast. Ryan's always a pleasure. FOMO, you're welcome back Thank anytime. Thank you, my friends. Brother. All right. All right, guys. Well, I hope you all have an incredible week. We'll catch you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Night.